Welcome uh, everybody to this workshop on computational plant genomics, uh, focusing on algorithms and uh, the related applications. I am uh, Yuri Pirola from the University of Milano Bicocca, and I jointly organized the workshop uh, with the Solon thesis from CWI in Amsterdam. The, the workshop uh, has been organized uh, in the context of a Pangaea project, uh, which is an uh, EU-founded project uh, aimed at uh, increasing the collaboration among researchers for shifting from a single uh, sequence-based reference genome uh, to pangenomic representations in general. I don't want to steal time uh, from uh, the following presentation, so for more, for more information, uh, Please have a look uh, to the project website, it's still in progress. But, uh, indeed, uh, we have uh, uh, a wonderful schedule with uh, five highly regarded scientists, uh, which will talk about their work. And uh, as you probably know, you know please use uh, the uh, Q&A panel on your right uh, uh, to send uh, the question to the speakers. Uh, so that they will answer at the end of the session, the final uh, uh, half an hour. So please uh, uh, put the name uh, of the speaker uh, uh, the question is intended for in the text of the question, uh, so that uh, we can match uh, question and, uh, um, and speakers at the end of the session. The first speaker is uh, Tobias Marshall. Uh, from the Henrik Hein University, uh, which will talk about uh, sequence to graph alignment and pangenome based uh, genome inference. So, thanks, Tobia, for being here, for accepting our invitation. And... Okay, yeah, thanks for the invitation. Let me try to get my, my slides up. Does that work? Yes, it works. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I want to start by uh, uh, by mentioning the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium. I I think there's probably a bunch of people from this consortium also on this call. But uh, for those of you who haven't heard about this, there's a big NIH-funded effort going on right now uh, that seeks to uh, finally built, built a pan genome and uh, as a first step generate the data needed to do this. So the goal is to generate uh, some 300 high quality genome assemblies over the next couple of years. So for, for those of you who are more, well, uh, algorithmic and are developing methods, that's, that's probably very good to, to know that this uh, sequence data is coming. So uh, the question of how to go from, from a set of haplotype resolved genome assemblies to, uh, well, to a pan-genome representation that we can actually use for, for practical purposes um, is a question that's, that's uh, well, becoming more and more pressing and, and will, uh, will be fueled by, by these exciting new data. Okay, so uh, I want to start with a little overview of a, of a bunch of tools that have been developed over the past years in, in my group. I'm not uh, going to be able to talk about all of them in detail, so I just want to give you a little, uh, uh, yeah, a little number of pointers in case you're interested in, in other topics. So the first two tools I'm going to present in detail today, which are Graph Aligner and Pangini. Uh, other tools that we have been, been working on include a new tool MPG by Mikko Rautiainen that, that's uh, for constructing sparse de Brown graphs. Uh, and Mikko observed that there's, well, there's many tools to construct such graphs. There's very few that can actually work well on, on uh, large values of K. So if you want to build a de Brown graph, but your K is, I don't know, 2000, then many of the tools designed for, I don't know, values of 30 or 50 start to break. Uh, then we have a, a, a tool or more a library called Psi that's for finding Kamer seeds in, in graphs uh, and that doesn't suffer from the exponential explosion 
of the number of paths that you have in, in complex graphs. Uh, Fawaz has made a tool for bubble calling. It's called Bubble Gun. And then there's WhatsApp for phasing, and this also has some, some graph abilities in the meantime. Uh, but that was just a quick overview. So the first part I want to go into is, um, is graph aligner. And uh, that's work uh, done by, by Miko Rautiainen. So the uh, mission of graph aligner is, is pretty simple. Given, well, given a graph, um, align sequences to it. So the assumption is that, uh, um, well, we have a graph where the nodes are labeled with sequences and the node labels can either overlap or not overlap. So both is supported. And we don't want to make any assumptions on, on graph topology. So we want to be able to handle graphs with cycles. And uh, in particular, uh, the particular use case in mind when, when starting this development was uh, noisy long reads. Um, this is in fact what, what Miko noticed when he, when he started this, that there wasn't any good tools for, uh, for noisy long reads. Okay, so before uh, I go into Miko's work, I want to credit uh, a very nice paper from the year 2000 by Gonzalo Navarro, and uh, that basically um, went unnoticed in the bioinformatics community for, for well, many years, I would say. At least I never saw it cited by anybody, so I want to particularly highlight it here. Um, what it does is basically generalize the classic needleman wunsch sequence-to-sequence alignment two graphs and what you see here is um, uh, sorry the resolution seems to come through badly um, what you see here is a recurrence and that looks familiar from sequence to sequence alignment the only thing you need to change when you align a sequence a query to a graph here is that uh, you have multiple incoming terms so you need to uh, to take the minimum over all incoming edges that lead to, to a node in the graph. Um, and Navarro's ob observation was that uh, this can essentially be, uh, be solved, or this DP table can essentially be computed in the same time as for the sequence to sequence case. So irrespective of the topology of the graph you, you put here, the runtime is uh, the number of nodes plus the number of characters in your input sequence times the number of edges and in, in case you put a linear graph, that's just a sequence that just coincides with the runtime of, of the classic needleman wunsch algorithm. So this is a, uh, if you don't know this yet, this is a, in my view, a classic paper that everybody in this field should read. Okay, let, let's go to uh, what Miko did. So the idea was to, uh, to do two things, to um, first of all, generalize Maya's bit vector algorithm for a sequence to sequence alignment to generalize this to graphs and uh, well then to figure out all the technical challenges that arise in particular handling cycles which is done in the spirit of Navarro's algorithm and handling a bandit alignment and well of course you need a methodology uh, methodology for seeding um, and that all this um, was implemented in graph aligner so to go through this um, sorry step by step. So the first thing that that graph aligner does internally, so there's a bit of a technical detail, but in order to handle uh, all graphs with overlapping or non-overlapping labels, uh, what graph aligner does is convert the input graph, be, in, be it a, a blunt graph with non-overlapping labels or the brown graph, or any other graph, it converts it to an internal representation that that is directed. So any bidirected input graph is converted to into a directed representation, which is achieved by, by duplicating nodes as needed. Okay, so just a quick recap of Maya's bit vector algorithm for sequence alignment. So if you want to align two sequences, um, and this is an example, um, and want to fill this DP table, what Myers algorithm does is it represents each column by its differences. So there's a classic uh, observation that, that the difference between each two adjacent cells in, in a DP table like this is at most one. So you need two bits to represent each difference between adjacent cells. 
And what you do is uh, you represent this or compute these differences between vertical cells and then represent them by two bits. And, and what Gene Myers came up with in 1999 is a way to go from, from a representation of one column to a representation of the next column in a, in a bit parallel manner. So if you have a 60-bit uh, architecture, that would allow you to, uh, to process 64-bit uh, six, architecture that would allow you to process 64 bits uh, or rows in parallel, which is a nice speed up uh, in practice. And uh, well, Miko thought that it would be a good idea to try this for sequence to graph alignment. Uh, the challenge is that now you have multiple incoming nodes, uh, incoming edges. So this node C has uh, incoming edges from, from node A and node B. And uh, that needs to well be handled in, in any sequence to graph alignment algorithm. So the way um, this was approached in graph aligner is to first think about um, what the, if this is an excerpt from the uh, DP table, then you would have a, a column with values for uh, corresponding to cell A or node A. And uh, if there was only one edge going from A to C, so only this one, then the values in the column for node C would look like this. And likewise, if there was only the edge from B to C, then this would be what, what the C column would look like. And since in this recurrence, you take the minimum, to compute uh, the column that really corresponds to, to uh, node C, uh, you take the minimum between this column here and that column over here. And the values you use, um, those are marked circled in red. So this is the minimum because three is smaller than four, four is smaller than five and so on. So this is what's going in here at the end. And uh, this is the, well, the, was the toughest not to crack how to do this in a bit parallel fashion. If you have bit parallel or, or bit encodings of these columns, how to uh, combine them and do this minimum operation. Um, so handling cycles is, uh, is done by, um, by initializing basically the values in our table with, the, with an upper bound. And an upper bound uh, well, is obviously easy to compute by just adding one for each step down. And then uh, you update columns using these bit parallel operations. You update uh, that, uh, that column here, and then you go and update that, and so on and so on. And what will happen is that at some point, you reach the same node again and don't need to do anything. So the value stays unchanged. And you can prove then at the time that happens, uh, the values have converged to their, to their correct value. Uh, now you can think that needs to or can go through very often or that many iterations would be needed. But in practice, it turns out um, it's usually uh, something like three, three iterations or you touch each, each cell something like three times and then usually a 64 row band in, in this DP matrix has converged to its, uh, its value. How often you need to go through this obviously depends on the topology of, of the graph. Okay. Okay, so the next thing that, uh, that we wondered about how to generalize uh, banded alignment. So as you know, many read alignments in practice uh, use banded alignment where you specify a band a band size B. And then if that's your whole DP table, you would compute values only inside the band, uh, given a seat. So you know that you, your alignment starts maybe here, and then you only explore this band because, uh, well, the rest of the table will probably not contain any, any good alignment. So that speeds up, um, that speeds up the alignment from O of NM to O of BM where B is the bandwidth. So generalizing this to graphs is uh, trickier than you might think on at first, because the tricky bit is if you, if you define a band on the graph, if you have a cycle, 
then this band kind of multiplies, right? If, if, if this is your seed and then you start to go down with this band and here's a cycle in the graph, then this band also goes through the cycle and continues here. And, uh, and likewise, if there's a fork, so bifurcation in your graph, it also will duplicate your band. So long story short, if you just uh, naively transfer this idea of banded alignment, what happens is that very quickly, your band will span the whole DP table because well, it can, can cycle and, and fork and it will be all, all over the place very quickly. So what, uh, what was the solution uh, that, that we came up with is the following. So if, if you are not predefining where your band is, kind of dynamically do, do this going, uh, well, row by row, uh, then you can define your band as the cells that have a certain maximum difference from, from your minimum in your present row. So what you see here, for instance, is uh, on the right hand side, you see an example where the band is defined to include all cells that are at most have a difference of at most two to the minimum in that respective row. And uh, that means depending on what the sequences are, the band can uh, well shrink or expand and it will kind of dynamically adapt to uh, where promising alignments are. Um, what this does is it still um, keeps this property that if there is an alignment within a certain edit distance, it's still guaranteed to find it. What it loses is any asymptotic runtime guarantees because the, the band, depending on the sequence, can become very, very wide. Uh, but it turns out in practice, this scheme works pretty well. So if, if you look at this example here where you have um, this graph, and the graph is, or this sequence, so there's a sequence read on the y-axis and this graph laid out on the x-axis, then how this band can look like is like this. So the sequence gets aligned uh, into node A and then it moves along and then starts touching node B. And then there's two options when it re reaches the end of node B. It can either go into node C or it can loop around and, and traverse node B again. And what happens in this case, so node C, if that's not the right path, so the band will shrink because the number of, well, the edit distance will grow and only the, uh, well, the band in, in, in this part of the table will survive. And the same will happen as you reach this point. Another time, this time, this band survives and then you go here and jump here. And in this way, this, uh, this tells you in which order to explore or which parts of the DP table to explore at all. Um, there's still, depending on how you construct your graph, I think this is a De Brown graph, uh, and this is zoomed into a very uh, hairball-y kind of, uh, kind of subgraph. And uh, there's still scenarios where this strategy also leads to bands that are way too big. And for this case, there's some heuristic prunings that graph aligner just says, okay, uh, I'll, I'll try to sacrifice finding uh, well, the best alignment within the band, but just trying to pick a path that's reasonable. And if that's not even possible, it will just terminate the alignment to avoid to blow up the runtime in these areas. Um, so we compared graph aligner um, on, a, on a graph that's just a linear chain of nodes. So basically we are fooling it into aligning to a linear sequence to just be able to be able to compare it to uh, to a just normal sequence to sequence read mapper. And we chose Minimap2 and most of you certainly know that Minimap2 is super, super fast. Um, and in this exercise, we see that the number of correctly aligned reads is comparable between Minimap2 and graph aligner. So the accuracy on this linear sequence is comparable whereas the runtime overhead is, is about threefold. And for super fast tool like Minimap2, that's, I find very acceptable for a tool that's, uh, for, that's able to align two graphs. Um, the overhead is comparable for, for, uh, for the memory use also. So it's a factor of three to four. Um, 
of note, most other sequence to sequence aligners are much slower. So graph aligner is much slower than, B, uh, much faster actually than BWA if you would compare this to BWA. So now we started to uh, compare the sequence to graph mapping. And for this, we uh, used chromosome 22 and uh, inserted all the variants found by the Thousand Genomes Project and then aligned PacBio long reads into this graph. And if you do this using VG, you find uh, a mapping accuracy around 94%. Uh, and you find that this takes some three hours. And with graph aligner, you can get it done in, uh, in 20 minutes uh, and would align 96.6% uh, of the reads correctly. One thing to say is that this is, um, well, something that VG is not really designed to do. VG is uh, the mapping routine is more optimized for, for short reads, but for the lack of other methods to, to compare to, we, we compare to VG here. In fact, the, the fact that this wasn't in VG uh, was one of the motivations for, for Miku to start uh, the graph aligner project to be, have a mapper that's able to handle long reads. Okay, so I'll quickly talk about uh, an application to error correction. So there is a very nice principle that was uh, introduced by Eric uh, Rivals and Lena Salmela in the Lordec paper. So you can, uh, can error correct long reads uh, if you have short reads and then use the short reads to build a brown graph. Then you align the long reads to the short, uh, to the graph and just replace the long reads by, uh, by the sequence of the path the alignment takes in the graph. And that's then an error corrected version of the long read. And what we tested is whether graph aligner uh, would be able to do this or whether we can use graph aligner to, to do this correction. Um, it turns out that uh, this works and in fact it works super nicely. Um, so here are three different uh, systems where we tested this uh, E. coli, fly and human. Um, and for, for E. coli, we also tested Lordec uh, that was kind of slow, so we didn't run it for the, for the larger data sets. Uh, but FMLRC turned out to be the best uh, uh, error corrector out there, so we compared mainly to this. And it turns out that graph aligner is much faster and also has a lower error rate. So if you go to all human, uh, all human genome setting, uh, we get this done around eight times faster and with about uh, three times less errors than, than a special purpose tool built for, for error correction. Um, this was kind of nice and encouraging. So what happened very recently is that um, Miko also started to explore the application in genome assembly settings. And this is a region from an assembly graph constructed from PacBio Hi-Fi reads. So very high quality graph. And what you see here is, is a, a genomic element. So multiple megabases in size that's, uh, that's traversed twice. So a big tandem duplication uh, with uh, some internal differences to, to one another. And uh, this is a region is complex enough to not be able, so that you're not able to resolve it from PacBio Hi-Fi reads alone. Uh, so what, what Miku came up with is a way to use graph aligner to map uh, ultra long Oxford nanopore reads into this. And it turns out uh, uh, this can solve regions like this. And then you combine uh, the nice, uh, well, uh, the nice sequence or correctness of Hi-Fi reads with the, with the length of, of ONT reads. And this shows that, well, it, it was a good idea to build a general purpose tool because many applications uh, seem to benefit from it. Okay, so the second part of my talk is about um, um, a different, different angle or different view on, on pan genomes and graphs. So one, one thing we wondered is um, what is the way if there is a graph genome or pan genome representation in the future, how can we uh, really exploit this in short read studies? And as you know, I mean, in, in short read studies, the cohort sizes just grow. I mean, there's, there's projects doing tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands and soon probably also millions of, of short read data sets. 
So what you need here is tools that that can leverage uh, pan genomes, but at the same time scale to to these massive uh, cohort sizes. And this is uh, something that that Jana Jana Epler in my group um, wanted to address with her tool Pangeni. And the basic idea is the following: that it does a process we call uh, pan genome based genome inference. Uh, because what we, what we seek to do is to use uh, a pan genome, and I'll talk in a, in a second about how we represent it, um, essentially a set of assembled uh, uh, human samples that have been assembled in a very high quality way using long reads. And then the idea is you, you see your next sample, so your short read sample, n plus one, and then you would want to run this, the raw fast queue, so unmapped reads as they come, you want to run this against your, your pangenome representation in short time. So in case of, of Pangini, this takes something like 20 single core CPU hours, depending on your, on your panel size, of course, but that's the rough ballpark. Uh, so that would return in, in one hour on a, on a 20 core machine. And then uh, what you would want is you want uh, genotypes for all the variation that's represented in, in your pan genome. And the way uh, we address this is we use a KMA based, uh, on the one hand, we use a KMA based approach. And the idea for this is, is as follows. So imagine you represent your pan genome using KMRs, and then you might have uh, a bubble like this encoding a genetic variant. So in this case, you have uh, K equals four. And you have three possible alleles, red, black, and blue. And this is how these alleles are represented in the graph. What you can now do is just count how often each of these k-mers occurs in your, in your input data set. And based on that, make a determination whether you think that this k should be present like zero times, once, or twice in your genome where the short read data set originated from. And if you are now color my, my KMERS in a color that corresponds to this abundance, then I can have a picture like this that shows me that this entry point is uh, twice in my genome, and this is twice in my genome, and these light yellow ones or orange ones are ones in your genome. And that would tell you that my genome on a study has this allele up here and that allele down here. One problem with that is that uh, there's a lot of variation in, in regions where KMERS won't be unique. And they need to be unique genome-wide in order for this process to work. So this will only access a subset of, of all the variation. So what we thought would be valuable is to additionally leverage the, um, a set of uh, haplotype paths that we know to exist in, in the population. So we have, build a panel of, of genome assemblies. And these genome assemblies would tell us how a graph representation of a genome looked like, but it would also tell us which path a certain number of known reference genomes take through this graph. So if we now have a situation like this that we know in our reference set of genomes, there's for instance, the green paths rep represented and the gray path and the blue path, and then assume you have a situation where some KMERs are missing in the sense that they are not unique and cannot be used for this, uh, for this process. So imagine these three KMERs here, here, and here uh, are just missing. So we cannot really say anything about them. And now imagine we have a, a bubble here on the left side where it's very obvious that uh, our study genome combines, well, this allele up here and that allele down here. Then we can make uh, an educated guess that given that we have taken this blue path down here, we also need to take the blue path over here, just because these two alleles have been observed together in a, in a reference and hence there's a linkage disequilibrium between them. So we would use this linkage information in this haplotype paths combinedly with the KMER information and that would uh, in this inference process tell us that the genome we are looking for uh, has this allele, that allele, this and that. So it would 
make a, basically an educated guess on which, uh, which of the alleles are there. Another way to, to say this is it would construct something like a personalized reference graph. So you might call this thing down here a personalized graph that we infer from, from looking at the k-mers in, in very short time. Okay. Um, well, what's going on, uh, I don't uh, have time to go through all the technical details, but uh, what's going on under the hood is that uh, there is a hidden Markov model. And for each of, of such bubble sites, there will be one state for every pair of possible uh, paths. So here there's three paths and you would have one state for each pair of such paths. And uh, what this does, each state would emit the corresponding k-mer counts in a, in a probabilistic way. And that defines a hidden Markov model, and then you can use a forward-backward process to uh, to compute posterior probabilities over all genotypes. Um, this scales quadratically in the end uh, in the number of, of haplotype paths, and to avoid this to become a problem when the panel grows, uh, uh, there are some resampling techniques that that uh, we have implemented. Okay, so we tested this. So we, um, we built such a representation from five publicly available uh, assemblies. And if I have some time at the end, I can give you some hints how they are constructed, uh, but that's a bit of a different topic. Um, so we have these five assemblies and um, each of them is haplotype result. So we have 10 haplotype reconstructions for, for whole human genomes. So if, if you map these assemblies to the GSCH38 reference genome, uh, and, and for now, for this proof of concept, restrict to the regions where all these 10 assemblies have, uh, have alignments, then you'll find this way we reason about 2.5 gigabases of the human genome and find some 6 million SNPs, 1.2 million indels uh, below 20 base pairs, uh, 46,000 indels of 20 to 50, and some 26,000 structure variants larger than 50, 50 base pairs. And what we now did is we did uh, a leave one out experiment where we used all these, uh, all these assemblies, but one to construct our reference. And then we used a short read data set of the missing sample, use Pangini to infer how it looks like, and then compare to, well, the, the assembly uh, that we have for that sample. Okay, and here's the result of this. So we, um, we compared this to, uh, for different coverages. So the dot sizes here are different coverages. Um, the colors are different tools. So we ran Pangini in uh, once, but filtered uh, based on the genotype quality. So it gives you a likelihood for particular genotypes and so you can arrive at a strict call set by filtering uh, more aggressively uh, and a lenient call set by just including basically everything. Um, we ran base taper, platypus, paragraph, and, and GATK haplotype caller. And this, these are results for small indels from one to 19 base pair. What you see on the, um, on the y-axis is the fraction of, of variants where the genotype was correct. So for where, where Pangini, uh, inferred the correct genotype, and on the X you see the fraction of, of variants that, that received the genotype. So where the tool set it could confidently genotype. And here you see if we set a more strict cutoff, we genotype fewer variants, but at higher accuracy. And if we, if we uh, set a more lenient cutoff, we genotype almost everything, uh, but receive a lower accuracy. So for deletions, uh, this lenient setup gives you a configuration that's uh, pretty much uh, in the ballpark of platypus and GATK. Whereas as you set a strict cut of you, you get closer to base typer, which is even more stringent. So it types less, uh, but even more accurately. So for insertions, the picture is the same. For complex variants, which uh, are all variants where multiple different alleles over, overlap in a, in a non-trivial way, um, Pangini looks even, 
even better. Uh, so this is nice, uh, but not, well, not groundbreaking. Um, so for mid-size indels, um, it looks similar. So 20 to 50, the picture looks the same. So Pangini seems to be the leader of the pack uh, down here, which becomes a little more pronounced for insertions and, um, and for complex, it also does a decent job. Although you have to say that these variant classes uh, are much more tricky to deal with. Uh, where the difference becomes quite drastic is for large structure variants. So for everything above 50 base pairs, uh, this process works really much better than, uh, than other tools. So what you have here is you see that for deletions, it, it basically types almost 100% and accuracy close to 95, um, where the other tools really struggle and either give a poor performance or really type only a small subset of variants. And it's even more drastic for insertions where, uh, well, Pangini is up here and all the other tools are really, really, uh, really worse. So this is very uh, encouraging, especially given, uh, given how fast this process is. Um, so, yeah, I think the timing is good, so I'll, I think I'll stop here. Do you want me to go on a little, little more? Okay, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, so just let me, let me sum up. So we, I've presented two tools to you. One is, um, one is Graph Aligner, which is a multi-purpose sequence to graph alignment tool, and it's very fast. Uh, and it's particularly suited to map long reads to, to pangenome graphs, but also other types of graphs. Um, so basically can map to anything that can be represented as a GFA. Um, it was very handy for assembly and we are now working to may, well, make this process uh, uh, more automated and more reusable. Um, Pangini is a fast pangenome based genotyping or genome inference tool for short reads. And, and we think that it kind of shortcuts uh, from, from genome assemblies that are being done now at scale to, to value added to, to short read studies. Um, one another way to see this is that it creates these, what you might call personalized reference genomes. And if you want to map to a graph, you can well say, okay, you can, you can run Pangini first and then get closer to how the, how the genome looked like. And then you map reads to it to, to get uh, the rest right because there will also always be uh, residual mistakes of course but also rare alleles that this uh, uh, this individual genome carries that are not represented in your pan genome and you of course also want to find this um, so i think the message here is while, while there's still a lot of work to do there are now well basic tools to build a basic tool chain from start to finish to make use of of, of pan genomic data and uh, to really demonstrate that this can, can make a difference in practice. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank all of you for, for your attention. And I don't know whether uh, you'll have questions now or later, how, how that will work. I but think- In any case, uh, I'm happy to take questions. I think Paul has a question, but I presume, um, okay, so Paul, you can uh, interact directly. Uh, and if Paul can hear us. Yeah, yeah, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, no, I can now hear. So yeah, my question is about the the banded alignment stuff. It, what's your outlook on being able to find an algorithm that both guarantees both um, accuracy and uh, the running time? Well, I think the running time. Well, the short answer is you can always find adversary examples where, uh, where I think you cannot achieve both because these examples would kind of force you to explore the whole DP table. Um, so uh, I don't think that's possible in, in general. If you, if you want a guarantee to find the optimal alignment to go below, um, well, the, basically the uh, n squared time bound. Um, if that, I, I don't know whether that answers your your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks.
Um, okay, I don't see um, any other question. Uh, just I want to uh, mention, thank you Tobias for the, the excellent talk um, on this um, uh, important topic. I, I see that we do have, a, I was going to ask something else, but I will leave it uh, for later uh, because Paola has a question. Namely, can you use graph aligner to align RNA-seq data to a splicing graph? <laughs> uh, that's an excellent question. We, we have done this, actually. We have a preprint posted on precisely uh, this. So there, Miko worked together with a student from Marcel Schulze's lab, uh, Dilip Duray is his name, and they implemented a pipeline that would uh, download, basically, or take a... Uh, gene annotations and build one graph per gene representing the known splice site and all the known transcripts and then use graph aligner to align RNA-seq data, long read RNA-seq data to these graphs. And that uh, seems to result in pretty good uh, quantification. But another uh, interesting application of this was to, to be able to detect fusion genes. So they implemented a mechanism that would allow to the alignments to jump from one of the genes to another gene in order to find fusion fusion genes. So Paula, I'm, I'm happy to point you to, to the preprint where we, uh, where we tried this. Yeah, you can try to write it in the um, discussion forum. Uh, yeah, I'll try, try to do this yeah. after this. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, Yuri, shall we continue with Valentina? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Tobias, for your talk. There you okay, go. I need to screen talk. Video. Yeah. The next speaker is uh, Valentina Bohera from the ATH in Zurich, which uh, she will talk about machine learning approaches for cancer survival prediction. So thanks for being here. And Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to talk here. Although I see that my topic doesn't really match uh, pan cancer genomics, so it's not, oh, sorry, pan, pan genomics, it's not a genomics, it's more transcriptomics. And also, um, we don't really uh, compare uh, different uh, patients or different species. So um, I will start with the giving uh, the motivation uh, for what uh, I'm doing. Uh, so, sorry, up, oh, okay. All right, so uh, what we want to do uh, is that we want to take our expression data from cancer patients, but maybe not just expression, it can be also information about mutations or proteome or DNA methylation, and we try to uh, build a model to predict the survival of cancer patients. And uh, also we want to build a model that could be biologically interpretable. So by looking at the predictors, uh, predicting variables, we would like to know which therapy will work on each particular cancer patient. Uh, and uh, the data we are using, they have uh, a number of uh, specificities. Uh, for example, uh, we know that um, uh, we can get only a very small number of, amount of patients, so hundreds of patients, but each patient will get uh, lots of uh, observations, uh, uh, <clears throat> profile for him, uh, expression of 25,000 genes, and uh, maybe mutations also in these genes and DNA methylations in millions of sites. So uh, we need to deal with this uh, very unequal structure of the data. And also we need to deal with the fact that our expression of genes uh, and are very much correlated. So uh, when we build the model, we try to beat this um, collinearity of our data. And uh, this creates a number of challenges. So we, uh, the major challenge is to create a stable and interpretable model. And also, uh, if you want to bring our predictions to clinics, we cannot say to the clinicians, please profile all these big data sets. Uh, we need to focus on a small number of uh, biomarkers. So we need to build as simple model as possible. So how we try to solve it, uh, we try to integrate biological knowledge and uh, for us, uh, this biological knowledge is pathways, and I will talk more about it later. And these pathways are, are usually summarized in, in as lists or on networks. And today I'm going to talk about lists, but also there are methods that use networks. Uh, and also we try to use uh, extensive model regularization 
Um, and today I will talk about uh, using uh, multitask learning when we try to learn on several cancers simultaneously. And if I have time, I will also mention the use of side channel information. And just, yes, just uh, sorry. sorry. Uh, Solon, can you maybe sorry. mute yourself? Thank you. Um, so uh, to give you a um, very short uh, motivation about this uh, multitask learning, uh, why we uh, may be interested to do it, uh, imagine that we want to learn a survival model on cancer type, which has a very few number of patients. In this case, uh, it's uveal melanoma, and we have only 80 patients. And again, we have lots of lots of observations for gene expression and mutations, probably. Uh, so um, the model, um, it's very easy to overfit the model. So what we want to do, we want to uh, build uh, a model which will not only learn uh, on uveal melanoma, uh, but also, for example, on skill melanoma, uh, which uh, is supposed to be quite similar to reveal melanoma. So we will try to build models that will share parameters, but the degree of sharing has to be defined. So um, my talk today will be structured as following. I will give you a short introduction into cancer and a little bit uh, about pathway, pathways and transcriptional states. Uh, I will then present uh, the first part of work done by Gabriela Malenova and my team on uh, extend, uh, doing multitask learning for group lasso. And then I will talk about Daniel's projects. Uh, and uh, the first one would be to use explicit pathway activity learning uh, for survival models. And then if I have time, I will talk about using such channel information. All right, so I will start the introduction into cancer. You know that uh, cancer cells are very different from healthy cells. And uh, cancer cells are great invaders of our body. They have a number of properties. For example, cancer cells cannot uh, commit suicide. They can go into apoptosis, so they stay virtually immortal. Uh, they proliferate fast, usually faster than healthy cells. Uh, they can invade neighboring tissues. They can travel in blood vessels and create metastatic sites. Also, cancer cells escape from the surveillance of our immune system. And uh, they can also make uh, blood vessels grow into the tumor to get a supply of nutrients. So all these properties and some others, they are usually referred to as hallmarks of cancer, and they were really well summarized in this uh, milestone publication of Hanahan and Weinberg. But how can the cells acquire these hallmarks? Uh, there is no definite answer, uh, but um, uh, we can relate the uh, acquisition of these hallmarks to changes in transcriptional states and also in activation or disabling of signaling pathways. And I will uh, talk shortly about transcriptional states and signaling pathways, what they are. So transcriptional states are, um, transcriptional state is a vector in the uh, dimension of the 24,000 genes. Uh, and uh, uh, these genes, they code uh, for a different important proteins in the cell. And uh, the healthy cell uh, has, undergoes uh, some mutations and then the transcriptional state of a healthy cell changes to some transcriptional state of the cancer cell. And uh, these changes, uh, they reflect uh, the acquisition of these uh, hallmarks, uh, increased proliferation, invasion of neighboring tissues, and also uh, it's related to the activation of signaling pathways. So uh, what is a, a signaling pathway? Signaling pathway is a cascade of molecular reactions that allows a signal from outside of the cell to reach the cell nucleus and make a change in the prescriptional state. So for example, uh, here you see um, uh, beta cotinin pathway and uh, there are some receptors on the cell surface, then uh, wind proteins can bind to these receptors, modify the shape of the receptors. Uh, the receptor will then phosphorylate some protein in the cytoplasm. Uh, there will be a cascade of phosphorylations, uh, which are usually activations of uh, protein activities. And then uh, some transcription factors which were activated, for example, TCA4, will enter the cell nucleus and activate their target genes. And uh, the activity or the activation of this cascades of the signaling pathways is closely related to the pathway uh, to the hallmarks of cancer. So, for example, uh, uh, this uh, wind uh, pathway, when it's active, the cell can uh, become more mobile, it can uh, start uh, migrating uh, in, in the body and create metastasis. Uh, 
inactivation of the P50 pathway uh, can, um, is actually related to the cell death or escape uh, from apoptosis. The activation of proliferation circuitries, including the MIG pathway, uh, can sustain proliferative signaling and so on. So if we can say for a given patient which pathway are active, we can actually say what's going on in the tumor and even probably can suggest some treatments because uh, there are inhibitors of the pathways available and uh, valid, um, available uh, for, uh, for, for the use in clinics. And if, for example, the wind pathway is active and we think that uh, the metastasis is due to the activity of this pathway, we can use uh, wind inhibitors for this uh, patient. So how can we say that the given pathway is active or not? Uh, theoretically, it should be quite easy. Since a pathway will activate some regulatory proteins that will activate expression of more than 100 genes, or suppress the expression of 100 genes, we can actually look at the expression patterns of these target genes, and then based on the expression of these target genes, we can say whether a pathway is on or off. So, uh, um, more technically speaking, what we want to do, we want to take the matrix uh, of gene expression for our patients and then uh, calculate the matrix of pathway activities, if you want to do it explicitly, of course. And then based on these pathway activities, we can say which hallmarks are uh, active are in our tumor, and also we can uh, predict the survival of the patient. And as I told you also, based on this, we can suggest the treatment uh, for a given patient. Uh, how we implement it, we, uh, we know actually uh, the downstream targets of each pathway. Uh, so we use a database of uh, 63 uh, pathways and uh, we try to build a model which uh, will have nodes, uh, explicit or explicit, that is, will have latent nodes for the activities of these pathways. And our, our intuition is that uh, genes which are known targets of this pathway should be all connected to these latent nodes but not every pathway uh, is predictive for the survival, so these layers should be sparse, so not every pathway can be connected to the survival node. Um, so this is the intuition of what we want to do, and uh, we started uh, playing with linear models first, and uh, the classical way of building a linear model uh, for the survival nodes, this is uh, Cox regression, so here no pathways are used yet. So it's just that we have all genes and based on all genes we try to predict the survival of our patients and uh, as input we have the gene expression. Uh, we, um, as, uh, um, actually when we try in the model uh, we have uh, two uh, variables. We have the time of the event, y, and we also we have, we have the type of the event. Either it's death or it's right censoring. Right censoring means that the patient was excluded from the study but uh, at the time of the exclusion, we know that the patient was alive. And when we build the Cox model, we try to optimize this loss function. Uh, uh, and uh, this results uh, in the, um, the prediction of the time uh, to the event, uh, to the, actually time to the death. Uh, and, uh, um, yeah. and this is a classical model uh, to predict the survival uh, of um, cancer patients based on the expression data. Uh, but now we wanted to include the pathway information and we, uh, in the literature, we can find ways to do it. Uh, so for example, uh, Jean-Philippe Baird uh, and his team suggested using group lasso approach. Uh, here, what uh, we do, uh, we actually connect genes uh, to pathways and uh, we add this uh, term to the, um, to the uh, loss function. And uh, these terms will guarantee that most of the uh, weights uh, for most of the pathways will become zero and only pathways that really contribute to the survival will have non-zero weights uh, and like all of them can be non-zero so it's it will be uh, pathway weights will be put to zero by groups so groups which are important will have non-zero weights and groups which are not important will have zero weights and this works uh, actually uh, pretty well, uh, but we wanted to extend this approach and to um, apply our multitask learning. So we wanted to learn uh, these models, but uh, somehow uh, try to couple uh, uh, parameters uh, between two different cancers or maybe uh, more than two different cancers. So uh, how do we do it? Uh, we add additional term uh, to the loss function. We'll try to couple betas with some constant mu, uh, which are which corresponds to the extent of the uh, similarity we want uh, to have uh, between our betas. 
and uh, uh, we can apply uh, this type of approach on two uh, cancers, on pairs of cancers, the triplets, and so on. And now we have a biological questions, which cancers we should put together, because we don't want to put all possible cancers uh, available in TCG, for example, we don't want to run it on uh, you know, 13 different cancers. So uh, one of the ideas which, about which cancers uh, we should uh, uh, compare is by uh, simply looking at the gene expression and uh, take cancers for which gene expression profiles are quite similar. So here uh, we have a representation of our expression data in the UMAP space. This is a dimension induction space uh, often used uh, for transcriptomics data. And if you see uh, two, uh, so each, each uh, cancer patient is shown by uh, a dot and the color corresponds to the cancer type. And if uh, the two patients um, uh, have a short distance between them, it means that the expression profile generally is quite close. So you can see, uh, for example, that kidney clear cell carcinoma and kidney papillary carcinoma have very similar profiles. So if you want to run a multitask model, then probably you can uh, couple these two cancers together. Alternatively, uh, you can use a, an approach based on uh, the pathways uh, which are predictive for the survival. So you can run a group assay model individually on each cancer type, and then look uh, which uh, pathways come up as the most predictive, and then take pairs of cancers where um, the same pathways come up as predictive for the survival. And this is, for example, the case for skin cutaneous melanoma and uveal melanoma. Uh, out of seven most predictive pathways, pathways shown by stars, uh, there are five um, that are shared, and they are shown by blue stars here. So um, this is to say that uh, we can uh, use uh, multitask cloning probably on these two melanoma types. And we can include uh, some additional uh, cancer type as a third one if uh, the same pathways are predictive uh, for the survival, for example, head and neck squamous carcinoma. So if you want to learn it on triplets, we will just modify our loss function to add additional coupling terms. Um, so we, um, we programmed this model uh, and then we wanted to evaluate it. Uh, we need to use a standard technique for evaluation uh, of models in the survival analysis. And uh, um, I will just explain to you uh, the, what is the index we use for evaluation. So uh, when you build a survival model, uh, you uh, have your observations and uh, they're composed of two values, time until the event and uh, the status of the event. It can be death or it can be a ex exclusion from the study, a right censoring. But when we do predictions, we predict just one value, and this is time until death. So how can we compare uh, on the validation set uh, the true values and our predictions? So for this, there is an index which is called Corcondens index, and uh, this uh, index compares uh, rankings or ordering between uh, pairs, which are pairs of patients which are comparable. So I will explain to you what means comparable. When you work with the cancer survival, uh, you can visualize the survival of your patients in a Kaplan Meyer plot. Uh, in this plot, uh, you have uh, time from diagnosis on the x axis and you have the proportion of uh, survivors on the y axis. So, at the time of diagnosis, everybody is alive. And then, uh, if you see a step, it means that at this point the patient died. And if you see a cross, it means that this, mm, the patient uh, here was censored meaning that he was excluded from the study, but we know that uh, at the given um, time uh, he was alive. alive. So um, imagine we have uh, two events, uh, Y1 and Y2, and uh, the, one, uh, the first one is death and uh, uh, the second one is censoring. We know that uh, Y1, uh, uh, actually the death of the patient one, uh, happened before the death of patient two, because uh, at the time, at this time, the second patient was still alive. So these two events are comparable, and we know that Y1 is lower than Y2. Uh, if we have another event, which is again death uh, of patient three, uh, we can compare patient three and patient one, because we know that patient three died before patient one, and we can co compare patient three and uh, patient two. Um, so uh, we have, uh, 
two comparable uh, events, uh, three comparable events with uh, two comparisons. And if you have uh, a patient uh, four, uh, which was censored here, you can only compare him uh, with uh, uh, patient number three. So we know that the death of patient three happens before the death of patient four, but we cannot compare patient four with others because we don't know uh, how his death is comparable to the death of these people. Uh, so, based on, on this uh, possible comparison, we can calculate the concordance index, and this is uh, the number of concordant pairs uh, over the total number of comparable pairs, and concordant pair is when the true values uh, correspond to the predicted values. So, uh, you will see uh, lots of this concordance index uh, later on. Um, so, for example, uh, we applied uh, this multitask learning on uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and we coupled it uh, with ovarian cancer uh, here on the left and with ovarian breast cancer here on the right. And uh, we saw whether our accuracy of the model uh, increases uh, when we uh, learn on several cancers versus learning just on uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So uh, the uh, baseline uh, model is shown, is shown in blue. And uh, 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 we could see that if we learn on two cancers together, and this is the um, uh, orange curve, you see that the performance is increased. And uh, yeah, on the y, on the x-axis, you see different random seeds when you run the model. Um, we saw that uh, adding a third cancer, breast cancer, doesn't really improve the model further. Uh, and now we try to understand uh, uh, how, to, how to select the best pairs uh, and uh, uh, whether adding more cancer types can really increase the model or we should just run it on two um, two um, on pairs of cancer types. So um, uh, it was the work of uh, Gabriela uh, Malenova, who is a, a postdoc in my team. And uh, uh, we also tried an alternative approach to solve more or less the same question. And this approach was implemented uh, by Daniel Rosen. What he wanted to do, uh, he wanted to, to um, divide uh, this approach of prediction of survival from gene expression data into two independent uh, steps. So the first one would be uh, unsupervised learning of pathway activities and then um, as a survival analysis step. So uh, what he wanted to do, he wanted to explicitly learn pathway activities and then use it in the predictive model. Uh, the potential benefits uh, of this approach is that uh, it can, uh, by um, reducing dimensions to pathway activities, one can uh, dramatically reduce the number of input features and make the model much more stable uh, and maybe more accurate. And also, um, if we know uh, which uh, pathways, uh, pathway activities are predicted for the survival, uh, we can um, suggest what kind of um, treatment the patient uh, can uh, get. And also, um, separating uh, this approach in two parts. Uh, can allow us using non-cancer data for training in the first step. For example, we can add uh, healthy uh, gene expression data from healthy cells, uh, such as GTEC data. So uh, um, for this first step of dimension reduction, uh, Daniel tried uh, principal component analysis and two-node autoencoder, and uh, uh, he applied it on all cancer together, uh, having in mind that uh, if the pathway is uh, like all genes that contribute to pathway activities should be similar across different cancer types. And uh, here you have projections uh, of um, a genes, uh, sorry, of um, <laughs> here we have projections of uh, cancer patients on PC1 and PC2 uh, for different cancer types. Each cancer type is shown uh, in its own color. And this is done for one specific pathway, which is activated in endothelium, uh, which corresponds to growing blood vessels in the tumor. And uh, uh, here on the right, you see the representation of the um, two-node autoencoder. And by looking at this, we decided that actually we should go with the PCA instead of autoencoder, because it seems that uh, an autoencoder applied in this way only captures the differences between different cancer types, but it doesn't capture the activity of uh, this particular pathway. So all results I show you later, uh, they are done with the, the PCA approach as the first step. So uh, here I applied this uh, two-step approach uh, on uh, 14 different cancers. And um, 
I will work you through the results. So we looked at the accuracy of the model, measured this concordance index. Uh, when we use uh, one principal component for each pathway, two principal components for each pathway, up to seven. And we compared it with a model where uh, we use all genes, just the standard linear regression. Uh, uh, sorry, it's not just linear regression. Actually, it's, uh, it's elastic net. So we have a, a penalty uh, when we regularize the model. And also, we compared it to the model which we can build on um, genes which are included in the pathway. And uh, uh, then I'll try two different uh, ways of regularizing, uh, actually, sorry, not regularizing, to build the model. Uh, one is a linear one by using elastic net with elastic net uh, penalty. And uh, he also tried boosted trees. And he saw that uh, for some uh, cases, uh, like uh, for the breast cancer here, when we build the model uh, elastic net on all genes, we achieve better accuracy when, uh, when we use the PCA step as a first step. Uh, but for example, for uh, the boosted trees in this case, uh, the model which is built on just first principal components uh, of our pathways outperforms the model which is built on uh, 20,000 genes. So uh, you have the same, or actually slightly better performance uh, for the model which contains only 62 variables versus the model that contains uh, 20,000 variables. And uh, he looked at different uh, um, cancer types uh, and he saw that uh, more or less in any case, the model which is built on the first principal components performs more or less the same as the model which is built on 20,000 genes. Um, the next question he asked uh, was uh, whether uh, we should do PCA on all cancers together versus uh, PCA on uh, cancer types uh, separately. Um, and uh, we think that in most cases uh, you can, I, I will show you the results. So in most cases, the, uh, PCA on each cancer separately performs uh, slightly better. But uh, when uh, we don't have enough data for a given a cancer type, then we should perform the PCA on all cancers together. So here is uh, the comparison uh, between the accuracy uh, for a different number of principal components from one to eight for different cancers. And in green, you see uh, the accuracy on uh, when we do PCA on all cancers together, versus in purple, we see the accuracy when we do it on individual cancers. So for some cases, using all cancers is better, but in the majority of cancers, or a majority of cases, uh, learning individually performance as well as, well as good. Um, yeah, and then um, the second question he asked, uh, can we choose an advanced number of components we want to use? And the answer is very uh, easy. We need to um, design a nested cross-validation um, so that we can choose parameters inside the inner loop of the cross-validation. And uh, in this uh, architecture, we can uh, select the best number of components, but also we can select the best regularization constants for our elastic net approach. Uh, and uh, Daniel implemented this, and uh, he calculated the um, model accuracy. So this is measured by the concordance index uh, for the model, which includes all 20,000 genes in, in gray. And for the models are where uh, he performed PCA first, uh, and in blue you see uh, the concordance uh, when PCA was performed on all cancers together, and in orange it was when it was performed on cancers individually. Uh, the difference is not significant, uh, but we see that at least uh, it's not worse than uh, learning on all uh, 20,000 genes together. And in addition, such a model can uh, point out to pathways uh, that can be targeted in uh, cancer patients, which are actually uh, predictive for the survival. Uh, so the concordance was not drastically improved, but uh, the model stability was, of course, very much improved. Uh, and here, the uh, stability is measured by the congruence coefficient. This is like similarity of uh, coefficients of the model. And uh, uh, it's expected because the number of parameters is much smaller when we use PCA first, so uh, the um, stability increases. Um, okay, so uh, the conclusions from this part was uh, that um, we can uh, do multi-task learning, and uh, there are two ways to do it. Uh, we can 
create a group lasso model with the multitasking, or we can uh, design a two-step approach uh, where the first step would be PCA on all uh, cancers together for uh, particular pathways. Um, we tried both of them, we didn't compare them yet, uh, but uh, both of them look um, to work well, although the increase in accuracy is not dramatic, unfortunately. So we are still working uh, on uh, the improvement of these models. What we know is that um, uh, by uh, doing multitasking or um, doing this PCA step, we can uh, uh, increase the stability of the model, and this can be a good thing uh, for biological interpretation. Um, yeah, so what we will do next, we will also explore more the autoencoders uh, for the first step uh, uh, for the two step model. And um, we will think uh, whether uh, we should or maybe we should integrate the healthy data into the first step uh, of the two step model uh, to do uh, to better infer pathway activities. And uh, I think I have uh, 15 minutes left, right? So I can go on to the last part, uh, which is uh, uh, the side, uh, using the side channels uh, to try to further improve our, our survival models. Uh, so um, side channel, it's uh, um, something that you include in your model, but not as an input, not as a predictor, and not as a target variable, but as a side channel. And uh, in our case, uh, we predict an additional output when we train the model. And our, um, this uh, additional uh, side channel variable should be very much connected to the target variable, which is survival in our case, uh, so that uh, the latent, uh, latent variable S uh, can actually uh, uh, reflect better um, um, the processes that affect both uh, the survival and this um, side channel information. Um, I think things will become clear soon when I explain what we use as a side channel. Uh, so, um, in our case, uh, we use tumor size, lymph node spread, and metastasis as side channel information. So, this is a clinical information which is available for many patients, but not for every patient. And uh, in our reasoning, uh, the, the bigger the tumor, the higher nodes, uh, lymph node spread, uh, the more metastasis, uh, if, if, if the patient has metastasis, it means that the survival uh, should be um, bad, uh, but also it means that uh, some uh, cancer hallmarks or signaling pathways related to survival should be active in the patient if this patient has a high tumor size or lymph node spread or metastasis. So uh, we try to add it as a side channel information so that our latent uh, node here uh, could capture something uh, which is uh, related not just to the survival, but also to these parameters. And the benefits of doing this is that it should help us uh, to make the model more stable and uh, remove uh, spurious correlations uh, between the gene expressions. So how we build it, uh, we use still the Cox uh, loss function uh, for the survival. Uh, we use um, uh, additional um, um, three additional nodes that we want to predict, uh, and uh, we use categorical cross entropy uh, for the loss function. So this is actually uh, not regression but classification task because we have uh, yes and no. But do you have metastasis or you don't have metastasis? Um, do you have a lymph node spread or not? And uh, we have also a constant uh, which reflects uh, the. Um, the uh, magnitude of the effect uh, we want uh, to assign to this uh, stage information. And uh, we also regularize our model uh, by uh, adding elastic net penalty or just elastic penalty or using dropouts. So we test uh, three different models uh, for the regularization. And uh, I will show you some results we obtain uh, first on one particular cancer type, uh, breast cancer. So uh, what you see here is um, uh, model, model accuracy on the top. Uh, then in the middle, uh, it's uh, a model similarity measured by Pearson correlation between uh, coefficients of the model. And um, uh, here, the last row, it corresponds to the uh, 
a proportion of uh, coefficients that are non-zero, so it's the number of genes included in the model. And uh, um, on the x-axis, uh, um, you see the regularization constant uh, for each model. So the higher the constant, the less, uh, the fewer genes will be included in the model. Uh, and on the y-axis, uh, you see uh, the, um, the weight for the uh, side channel. So the first row corresponds that, uh, we, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, model where we don't use side channels at all. Uh, and the first column corresponds to uh, the model where we don't use the regularization at all. And in this case, uh, the results for Latinat and Lasso uh, will be the same. So uh, what we could uh, see uh, when we look at the, the model accuracy, uh, the best values, uh, the most yellow ones, uh, they correspond actually to a mix uh, of uh, using non-zero parameter for the clinical, uh, for clinical information um, side channel uh, and also for the regularization. And it's true for all three regularization models, elastic net lasso and dropout. And uh, it was uh, like this for most of the cancer types, I will show you later. Uh, also, if you look at the model similar similarity, we see that uh, um, the stability also increases with the adding such information. Uh, and uh, if you look at the proportion of the genes, we see that uh, the number of the genes included in the model um, uh, decreases if we don't use any regularization. So, uh, it means that uh, adding side channels works uh, as a localization uh, uh, method by itself. Uh, but if uh, we look at the models where already some localization is applied, uh, then actually uh, when we increase the side channel weights, uh, the number of genes increases. So um, uh, the conclusion is that uh, side channels can work as a regularization method, uh, but only when no other regularization is applied. And if you look at all cancer types, uh, we see that, that there is uh, some improvement uh, for um, uh, the accuracy of the model uh, in the case of lasting net loss and dropout. I calculated the statistical, uh, yeah, actually I didn't calculate the statistical significance of this increase yet, so I cannot tell you. Uh, and uh, we can um, also see uh, the increase in the uh, model stability. Uh, so uh, our conclusion is that it's a, it's a promising method uh, to try to improve uh, the accuracy of the model and especially model stability. Unfortunately, it didn't provide a big increase uh, in accuracy, um, but maybe this is because we applied uh, to uh, a regular uh, models such as elastic net and lasso and not the group lasso that I discussed in the first part of my talk. So. Um, the conclusions for this part is that by using clinical staging information as additional output, but not as input, we can improve slightly survival models. Uh, it can be also uh, used as an additional way to regularize the model. And uh, in the future, we'll try to add this side channel information to our Cox regression uh, group lasso or to the two-step model that uh, Daniel uh, developed um, um, and I presented before. Uh, I would like to thank uh, these two postdocs who work in the project, uh, the ETH Zurich uh, Startup Funding uh, to pay these postdocs, and uh, Aurelian Lucci from the Thomas Hoffman Lab uh, for the discussion. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Valentina, for the nice talk. Um, let me uh, clarify for everyone because we got um, some questions with uh, Yuri uh, offline. Um, so as you may have noticed, um, uh, only the people who are in the panel can ask uh, questions live. Unfortunately, this is the, the, the platform that is provided to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one thing that we wanted to clarify. The, the second thing we wanted to clarify is that as per the schedule, uh, the, there will be uh, uh, at least half an hour of questions and, uh, and answers session in the end. So uh, what the participants can actually do uh, if they are, uh, if they see the, uh, the, the platform page, they are currently logged on from ECCB. There is a live Q&A uh, uh, panel, which they can click and they can 
add their questions uh, there. And then at the end of the, of the talks, uh, the, their questions will be there and um, the, um, uh, the, party, the speakers can see at, the, at their questions and, and answer them. Um, Yuri, I, I'm not sure if I, I missed something, but this is the process, right? Yes, it is. Uh, so that we can keep up uh, with the schedule without... Uh, yeah, so th this, this will be at the end, and, uh, but uh, because uh, some participants have questions, I just wanted to clarify it uh, now. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. I will wait for the question and answer session. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, we have a, a general question. We have maybe some minutes before the next talk. Will you share the presentations? Uh, I think that the ECCB organizers are recording the, uh, the sessions and the uh, video will be made available by the ECCB. Uh, they also ask uh, for slides. Uh, maybe Valentina, are your slides available, or can you? I would. I would. It's it's not published work. Uh, so if you want to have my slides, please uh, drop me an email. I will send it to you. Okay. Yeah, and I think anyway that for now the recording uh, should in, should include the slides. But uh, yeah, if you can email Valentina, or if you actually need the PDF, it will be better. Yeah, thanks. Mm. There's a question, Son. Do you want to to answer to? Which question? Uh, by Don Gili, uh, which asks uh, to Valentina. I'm sorry, I think I missed the description of the data. Yeah, I think we have five more minutes for Valentina, so I guess uh, she can answer now if she wants. So Valentina, can you uh, see the question or shall I? Uh... I, I don't see the question. Uh... So um, Don Gili, um, says, I'm sorry, I think I missed the description of the data. It's a short question. Can you explain uh, something about the data? Number of patients is data points, number of genes is feature, then what are the values of the data stands for? Are they gene expression values or something else? Yeah, so the, the two uh, projects, three projects I pre presented, we use gene expression values only uh, but uh, in theory, we should be able also to integrate other types, other layers of omics data, genomics data, and DNA methylation. Uh, but so far, uh, we just uh, started playing with transcriptomics data. So it's gene expression. Okay, thanks. I think we can continue, Yuri, and then take the questions. Okay, perfect. We can continue with the next speaker. It's Cedric Shaw from uh, Simon Fraser University, which uh, will uh, talk about annotation-free isoform discovery from long reads. Hi, Cedric. Thanks for being here for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Yuri. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'll start to uh, share my screen. Perfect. Can everybody see my slide properly? Yep. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, discuss um, some current and published work done with uh, my colleague Faraz from UBC and our joint students, Barra. Uh, it's not about pan genome, but it has some kind of flavor of pan genome because it's uh, about uh, isoforms. So we are interested in isoform diversity. 
and we are working from uh, noisy long reads. Okay, so the first thing I want to uh, discuss this is the difference between isoform identification and discovery. So we have three cases here where we have a data, likely a noisy long read for us. There is, uh, so this is transcriptomics long reads that come from a transcriptome. Um, and you have a bunch of isoforms that were sequenced and you want to reconstruct these isoforms. So uh, on panel A, this is a case where actually you have a, a, a reference uh, transcriptome and you only want to identify which isoforms from that reference are present in your data set. So in this example, suppose you have three ISO uh, reference transcripts, A, B, C, and the data uh, suggests that A and B are present. The second kind of annotation based uh, isoform uh, identification does not rely on uh, a reference transcriptome, but on a database of non splice junction sites. So in that case, you might discover novel isoforms from your data. So this is panel B, but they will be based on the non splice junction sites. And what we are interested in us is to work in case C, where we have no uh, previous knowledge of the uh, transcriptome we uh, do study. So the only thing we have is a genome with annotated genes uh, and long reads. And we want to detect non or novel isoforms and novel isoforms could use novel splice junction sites. So we work in case C with uh, no prior knowledge. So and that work was motivated in part by a, a recent uh, effort to use uh, Oxford nanopore uh, long reads to a sequence transcriptome. And here is a Nature Method paper that detected that actually a very large portion, portion of the isoforms that were detected by using uh, nanopore RNA sequencing um, were novel, uh, including a lot of novel splice uh, junction sites. Okay, so this is a motivation to uh, go annotation free. So what I'm going to describe today, this is a tool that we call Freddy's that is uh, almost finished. Um, that does that, that analyze uh, noisy long reads uh, from a transcriptome to detect uh, isoforms with no prior knowledge. So just a, a reminder about uh, transcriptomic reads. Um, in general, they are noisy, especially for Oxford nanopore. Um, let's say that there might be up to 15% error rate that is dominated by indels. And so the, the indel errors uh, are problematic, especially for transcriptomic because they might um, hide some small exons and they might uh, make it difficult to detect splice junction site at a high resolution. So this is the cartoon we have on, on that side here, where we can see a small exon here that was missed because of Indel uh, in the middle read, or here we can see that there is an unclear position for the splice junction site on the, on the left. Other kind of issues we have with long reads, this is that um, despite the presence of uh, many full length transcript uh, reads, uh, not all reads represent full length transcript. Uh, in our experiment, we do observe quite uh, a high rate of uh, transcript molecules that actually end up in more than one read, in two reads. Uh, and then you have some other issues about palindromic reads, chimeric reads, and, and so on. So the data is quite noisy, uh, unlike the short uh, RNA-seq reads that we've been used to work with for a long time. Okay, so we need to uh, handle to address this noise in the data in the method. So Freddy, the method we developed, uh, is basically split into uh, three elements, three parts. 
Um, first, there is a relatively simple uh, pre-partition that basically splits the transcriptome reads into sets associated to a single gene or a few genes um, that are co-located along the genome. And each of these set of long reads then can be processed independently. Then the first important part of 3D is the segmentation. When we have a set of reads that correspond to a gene, so all the isoforms of a given gene, then we need to uh, segment them into a segment that might correspond to uh, exons or retained intronic regions. And once we have that, then we have a clustering stage where we cluster reads into uh, clusters, each cluster representing a potential isoform. So I'm going to go quickly about the pre-partition stage, which is not very interesting or difficult, uh, but uh, basically it's uh, based on aligning long reads onto a genome, so a reference genome, and then clustering them together in terms of their overlap. So here we have an example that will end up in two clusters, the cluster of red uh, long reads and the cluster of black long reads um, based on the overlapping alignment. Okay, and the clustering can be done uh, with just simple single leakage cluster. So the result of that part, these are uh, read sets and each of them can be processed independently of the other ones. And so we're going to concentrate on what we do uh, is one read set. So the uh, segmentation is actually quite a, a difficult problem that uh, uh, took most of our time when designing 3D. Uh, so here you have uh, on that uh, slide an example of four long reads that represent various isoforms. And the red squares along the, the, the bottom line represent the boundary of segments. So on the top, you have um, the perfect data that actually do represent the isoforms. And then you can see that you have relatively sharp boundaries that are defined by actually the exons or intronic regions retained in the isoforms uh, mapped onto the genome. And that could give us a, a segmentation uh, of these isoforms. Uh, with the long reads um, that have been sequenced from these isoforms, then we have to deal with the in the rate and the uh, errors. And so what we can see this is that the long reads do not uh, translate into such sharp boundaries representing um, the various segments. And so what we end up having is actually many more uh, segments than the one in used by the two isoforms, um, including very short ones that are due to uh, errors in the long reads. So if we were just going to rely uh, naively, I would say, on the, on the raw alignment to the genome, then we would have a much larger number of segments representing um, the, say, the alphabet for the alphabet for the content of the two isoforms. So we need to process this kind of initial segmentation phase to uh, smooth and reduce the number of segments. Okay, so what we are doing uh, is described on that slide. It's relatively simple in principle. Uh, so you start from the alignment of the long reads onto the genome and what you expect at, at the boundary of a segment given that it represents uh, a diversity of isoform, that means that there are two sets of isoform that will, one set will contain the segment, the other set will not, you expect to see a change in the coverage. That means by, by the aligned long reads. So the top figure on the left represents the peaks of the coverage uh, of the genome or the gene uh, from the aligned long reads. And that will be the initial segmentation, the one we need to correct. And to correct it, we proceed in, a, proceed in two stages. The first one is we, we smooth these peaks uh, because we have observed that quite a, a large number of them are actually artifactual. And we use a simple Gaussian filter to, uh, to smooth them. That will give us uh, the, a set 
smaller of candidate breakpoints for the segments or candidate segment uh, coordinates. And then from this set of candidates, which is still large, we apply a, a new uh, dynamic programming algorithm that we developed that is cubic in time uh, and cubic in the number of candidate breakpoints to extract a subset that minimizes the number of reads that are only partially covered uh, in the segments, so uh, kind of the error in the data, and maximizes the number of reads that support a segment. So we combine these two uh, optimization objectives into our dynamic programming algorithm. So this is, in, in principle, quite uh, simple, uh, but this is an essential part of 3D. On the right, you can see uh, some uh, segmentation and coverage of uh, a gene in the genome based on real data um, where, uh, that illustrates actually what, what we really deal with. Okay, so at the end of that phase, each long read can be uh, described as a binary vector that um, decides, you know, that uh, encodes if a segment is present or not in the long read. So we have segmented the gene and we can encode each long read as a binary vector. And that's what we see here. We uh, turn the set of long reads into um, a binary matrix. Each row is one read, each colon is one segment, and the one means that we observe that segment in the long read, the zero means that we don't. And what we want to do now, this is a clustering problem. We want to cluster the long reads uh, in two different clusters where each cluster would represent one isoform. Uh, to do that, given that we know there is noise in the data, uh, the key point would be that we want to uh, allow error correction. That means that we want that some zeros can be turned into one because, for example, we can see that the long read was partially covered by the segment, the threshold we used uh, turned into a zero, but there is support from other long reads that says it could be a one. Okay, so this is the main change we'll do, we'll allow for error correction. And we don't know initially, obviously, the number of clusters because we don't know how many different isoforms are in the data. So to handle these two challenges, we designed uh, a clustering problem that we call the Mercy problem, minimum error clustering in two isoforms. And I'm going to describe that now. Um, so what we do actually, given that we don't know the number of, of uh, clusters, the number of isoforms, we're going to uh, repeat, um, to iterate uh, a two clusters uh, problem where uh, we take the reads, we cluster them into two sets. One will represent an isoform and the other one is what we call the recycling cluster. And then uh, after identifying an isoform, we just repeat the process on the reads in the recycling cluster. And we do that until we uh, hit some kind of stopping threshold um, that is based on the number of reads left in the recycling cluster. So at the end of one iteration, we have two sets of reads, one set that represent a potential isoform and one set that we'll deal with later. Uh, so the set that represents the isoform, uh, we use it to actually define the content of the isoform in terms of the segments, which uh, exonic and intronic segments are in the isoform. And to do that, we just simply use a consensus of the reads in the isoform cluster. If there is a one somewhere uh, in one of the reads of this cluster, then it is a one in the isoform. The segment is present. So um, to find the structure of the isoform based on a cluster is simple, we just do a consensus. Okay, so here on the picture on the uh, right, here, the reads one, two, and three uh, will be the isoform cluster, and the read four, reads four and five will be the recycling cluster. So what kind of corrections did we need to do when we have clustered read one, two, and three together? Uh, we can see that read two had a one in segment four, so um, read one and read three, the zeros that they have in column four need to be corrected into a one. Similarly, read five, uh, had a one, uh, sorry, read one and three had a one in column five. 
well, read two had a zero, so we correct that zero into one. But uh, one thing which is important, this is that colon one, read one and two have a one, read three has a zero. We do not correct that zero because it might result actually of the truncation of the read during the sequencing process. So the correction is limited to uh, zeros that are framed by two ones on the left and the right. Okay, so here we would need in that cluster to correct three reads to have a correction cost um, of three. And then the objective function is simply um, the sum, the weighted sum of the correction cost plus the number of uh, reads in the isoform cluster. So that's basically the problem we uh, deal with. Uh, this is a general uh, principle. It's a little more complex in practice. For example, when we want to correct a zero into a one, we want to ensure that actually the read uh, had some sequence in that segment, but it didn't pass the threshold that uh, would decide a one. So we need to actually use the actual uh, sequence data of the read to uh, see if it could be corrected in, from a zero to a one. We have a last column that corresponds to the poly A tail to decide which uh, reads can be corrected uh, on the right uh, if they don't have a poly A tail. So we have a few more um, uh, constraints based on, on the actual you know, transcriptomic uh, isoform discovery problem. But the principle of the clustering problem is the one I described. Um, it, it takes uh, its origin actually in um, the work that has been done in, in haplotype, uh, haplotyping uh, and based on error correction problems. Okay, so we did some simulations first to um, look at uh, the performance of Freddy. And so we simulated a data set of Oxford nanopore transcriptomic reads for human chromosome 21, and we obtained uh, 30,000 reads and the simulation was calibrated on some in-house uh, Oxford nanoporeal data set that I'm going to describe in the next slide. So we, uh, com we compared with two competing tools, FLARE, that uses a database of annotated splice junction sites, and string tie 2 that is annotation-free like free. And the accuracy measure is a SecPAR index that we modified a little bit, uh, but I'm, I'm not going to describe the details here due to lack of time. So what we can see is that flares that uses uh, annotated splice junctions um, do find uh, a large number of true isoforms uh, and do not predict too many wrong isoforms. And this is uh, kind of expected because it relies on the annotated splice junction site. String tie 2, which is uh, really comparable to Freddy, do not find as many detected uh, true isoforms and flare, uh, and detect quite a, a few extra isoforms. Uh, and Freddy, uh, out of the three tools, is the one that detects the largest number of true isoforms at the cost of being the one that predicts also the largest number of uh, wrong isoforms. So uh, this is where it uh, stands currently uh, on this experiment. We also run uh, Freddy on the real data that we generated at the Vancouver Prostate Center, uh, where so we are interested in prostate cancer there. So we uh, sequenced a prostate cancer cell line, 22RD1, uh, and we generated uh, 3 million reads that were quite long, uh, generally. And given that uh, we work with our uh, prostate cancer colleagues, we uh, focused on one uh, specific gene, which is very important for prostate cancer, the androgen receptor gene. And here we have an example of something that we discovered with uh, Freddy, so the discovery of a novel isoform that has an interesting structure because it relies uh, on a cryptic exon and a novel retention of roughly a thousand base pair introning segment. This is another isoform on, on the top. And then when we uh, looked at some validation, we downloaded some short reads RNA-seq data for 22 rv one And we could see that this intronic segment is actually covered uh, 
uh, with roughly uh, an 11, 11x coverage in the short read um, data set, an ASIC data set, uh, but the novel isoform was never, never predicted. Okay, so this is one example of the kind of discovery you can do with uh, this tool. So to conclude, yes, uh, so uh, we had propose a discovery tool for isoforms that is annotation free. It only relies on an annotated genomes, genome. Sorry, uh, Two main elements, a segmentation uh, algorithm that actually was uh, took a lot of our time and was less trivial than we thought it would be, and a novel clustering problem, the Mercy problem that we solved using integer linear programming. So far, it looks like it's, it's quite sensitive to uh, detect a lot of true isoforms. And what we are currently working is to post-process the result because we noticed that many of the um, wrong clusters are actually very short clusters where the reads could be merged to existing larger clusters at a small correction cost. So there, is, there are some uh, clustering issues that can be addressed with some simple post-processing that, that we are working on. Uh, and we're working with our uh, colleagues of the VPC and the validation of novel isoforms. Uh, and we have some plans to expand uh, that tool to uh, other kind of isoforms. And that's it. So I want to uh, thank um, the research group of Faraz at uh, UBC, Esan Hossein, Fatih, and Delpunj, and all our VPC colleagues for the wet lab works and the discussion about uh, the androgen research logic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sensei. Okay, Frederick. Uh, maybe I don't think uh, we have time uh, for question now. Uh, we have some question in the panel, but uh, shall we postpone to the final uh, yeah. session? And let's uh, go on with uh, the next speaker. Paul Medved from the Penn State University, which uh, will talk about uh, reference-free error correction of uh, Oxford nanopore transcriptome data. Thanks, right, thanks. Paul, for being here. Thanks for the introduction. Can you guys see this? Yes, we see. Okay. And, and, and I, I do have uh, some problems with the internet and occasionally kicks me off, but, but I'm back within 20 seconds. So if you see me freeze, don't panic. You'll okay. still hear the rest of the talk. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So this is, um, this is uh, this talk. Yeah, apparently have a... uh, Stockholm. Okay. Um, so the talk is about reference-free error correction of Ox Oxford Nanoport transcriptome data. Uh, um, yeah, I think the previous talk we kind of covered a lot of the basics, so I can go quickly here through the introduction. Um, you know, we have we have a genome. Um, the genome has genes. So in this example, we see three genes. Um, each gene is composed of multiple exons. And I guess what I wanted to, the point I wanted to make here is that there are duplicate genes like this gene and this gene, and they form together a gene family, but um, they're very similar, but there are some mutations that set them apart. Okay. So then we have uh, um, transcription, happens and we have each of these genes give rise to isoforms um, and then we have long read sequencing and I think you know as Cedric mentioned there are uh, many advantages of doing long read sequencing on the transcriptome data we get a lot of end-to-end -end reads for example so we can really get the complete isoform structure and we can link mutations like with short reads, we wouldn't be able to tell apart these two mutations. Uh, we wouldn't be able to tell if they're on the same gene or on different genes, and with long read, we can. 
Uh, but we do suffer from higher error rates here than short reads. Okay, so I'm going to present Ison Correct. It's a tool uh, to error correct reads, and uh, specifically nano, uh, Oxford Nanopore reads from the transcriptome. We it is a non-hybrid method, so there are methods that do this that also rely on having short read data. We don't do this. Um, and you know there may be cases where you, you want to do this, but in other cases you don't. And the key aspect which to set us apart from the previous talk is we are going to be working reference free. So we're assuming that either we are in, a, um, in an organism where we don't have uh, either a transcriptome or genomic reference um, to which we can align, or we simply we have one where we simply don't trust it and don't want to bias our, our results. As far as, far as we know, uh, we were, this was the first algorithm to address this problem, um, though um, some, another algorithm came out shortly afterwards as well. So the, the short version of our result is that uh, we're, we were seeing uh, error rates initially at 7% from the raw technology, and we are able to reduce it to 1% with ISON correct. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, be, besides uh, Rattle, which is another tool that does this, um, it came out recently, all other tools are, are either designed for genomic data, um, which, which which there was a recent study by Lima et al that showed that you can't just run a tool designed for genomic data on transcriptomic data. Uh, it's it's not gonna it's gonna have a lot of problems. Or other other methods out there that are reference based or using hybrid um, approach, so using short reads as well. And so the challenges that we face in, in doing this error correction is, of course, um, alternative splicing um, and the variable abundance that we're we're seeing in, in transcriptome data. So uh, before I get into the details, just the bigger picture of wh what how Eisen Correct is going to work. We start with a, a set of raw reads, and our initial step is to cluster these reads according to their gene family of origin, and this is done by uh, a tool that we published last year called Eisen Clust. After that, we take each of these uh, clusters and we correct the reads in those clusters. And that's what we're gonna talk about, uh, what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, and then, uh, so, so this uh, can be done in parallel. So each cluster is done independently. And uh, we never split reads or give up on reads. So this is sometimes what other tools uh, might do. So we, you know, if you have 127 reads in the cluster to begin with, you'll have 127 reads after error correction. Uh, and the final step and uh, is to go from these reads to really a set of transcripts or isoforms. And this is more, it's kind of like what uh, Freddie um, was doing um, really to get you to that final set, whereas, uh, and you know that involves things like looking at the ends of the transcripts. Um, so we're we're not doing that. We're in this talk just going to talk about error correction. Okay. So um, our overall strategy has two parts. So the first part is to partition each read into segments. Um, and basically, what we want to do here is, I mean, ideally our segments would be exons. If we knew what the exons would be, then this would be easy. Um, if we had a reference to align to, then we could use those alignments um, to segment our, um, our read. And th this is what the previous talk was talking about. But we don't have that. Okay, so what, what do we want then? Can, can we frame it as a computational problem? Well, we wanna, we wanna uh, partition each read uh, into segments such that the segments are non-overlapping. Okay, that makes sense. If they were overlapping, it would be not clear how to uh, error correct them afterwards. We want the segments to cover most of the read. 
Uh, so in, in a sense, the partition is sort of, it's a, we're using the term loosely here because some part of the read maybe is not gonna be covered by a segment, but we do want most of it to be covered by a segment because we want to correct most of the read. And then each segment should be found in, in as many reads as we can. And that's gonna maximize the power of our error correction uh, afterwards. And then we don't want segments to cross exon intron junctions. And for this, we notice that the, 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 if we find segments that maximize the number of reads that support them, we are going to implicitly find segments that don't cross exon intron junctions. Because if, if it's really, well, I should say it's junction that might be alternatively spliced. Because if it's alternatively spliced, you'll see, more, you'll see less reads spanning the whole thing than you would on the separates on each side of it. Uh, okay, and uh, so that's our, our segmentation and I'll, I'll go into it a little bit more. And step two is then for each segment, we recruit all the other reads that contain it and we use that to do error corrections. Okay. Uh, so here's a little more detail in our algorithm. In order to do the segmentation, we do a scan through the reads through all the reads in the cluster. And we do a winnowed minimizer sketch. So for a window size, we take the smaller camer in, in that smallest camer in that window. And then as we scan through the genome like this, we identify all the camers that are minimizers. So here, read one has uh, seven minimizers. And here we're saying it, it's occurring at position P1 through P7. Okay. Now, in this case, notice in this example, we have five reads and um, we have, it might look like three isoforms. Um, well, we, we do have three isoforms, but we are, they're coming from actually two different genes because we have a mutation that separates them. Okay. Okay, so once we've created this uh, kind of minimizer uh, sketch of all the reads, we can now try to match segments. So we're going to think of segments as being um, basically two minimizers that are nearby and the segment between them. So the, so the segments will have to be anchored on the two sides by the minimizers just to make our, our computational life easier. And so we're so here for read one, we're going to take all pairs of nearby minimizers where we have a parameter of what nearby means. Uh, for example, the green and the red, here's the green and the red, the green and the orange, the green and the orange, and then the red also and the purple, red and the purple, and so on. Okay. So these are our potential segments. Um, and now what we're gonna to wanna to do is um, for each segment, count how many reads include this uh, se sequence. So for example, this red and purple is contained by two reads. Uh, this read, excuse me, this, uh, yeah, red and purple is contained by this read and the second read. So we want, we want that to be big. And then we want, remember the, the segments to span as much of the read as possible. So we multiply that uh, number of reads by the distance uh, between the two minimizers. So the length of the segment. All right, so we, and, and from this we said that we give each segment a weight. Okay, that's the product. How many reads include the sequence and what's the distance between them. Okay. So we do this for every segment. And now we are going to solve um, the weighted interval scheduling problem. You, you, you may have seen this in your undergrad algorithms class. There's a classical optimal greedy algorithm that basically finds the maximal number of segments here that are, uh, sorry, not the maximal number, the, the, the set of segments that are non-overlapping and that maximize the total weight. And, and, and as a result, we get something like this, which is the partition that we were looking for. Um, now, notice before I get into step two, notice that the partition 
it, it, you know, a single exon, if it's large, may be represented by several segments. Uh, and that's fine. We're, we're more concerned to not cross an exon junction than we are to have a, a segment that's, uh, that have an exon split into several segments. Okay, so once we have this partition of read one, we now recruit all the reads for every segment separately. We recruit all the reads that contain that the sequence in that segment. And we, we do kind of an edit distance computation to allow for some errors. And from that, we identify the, um, the putative variance. We, we look at the alignment matrix and we look at the frequency of each kind of the column that is has some disagreements, and if the frequency is above some threshold, which I won't go into detail, but sort of depends on the um, sequence context. But if it's if it occurs frequently enough, then these punitive variants are identified, and then we correct each segment to um, the putative variant that matches better what's in that segment. Okay, and th that's pretty much the algorithm. The only thing that to add is is uh, that we want to. Uh, a lot of these computations are going to be redone. If you think about this computation for the for the uh, green and, and red segment, when we get to read two, if that green and red uh, makes it into the final solution then we are going to be we're basically going to do we have to redo this whole alignment so in order to avoid doing that we basically save our calculations and the putative variance for future computations if they if, if we need to use it again okay so that's that's the overview of the method and again i, I had to leave out a lot of details due to time so here's the summary of the result. We um, we took three data sets, a, Drosoph a real Drosophila data set, um, a simulated human data set from chromosome six, and a serve data set, which is a spike in um, synthetic data set. It, it's real sequencing, but we know exactly what the transcripts are. So th there's no there's no biological vari uh, variation there. Yeah, so, and, and the, the error rate before was 7% and afterwards is, you know, between half, of, between 0.4 and 1.1%. Um, a, a few caveats, this Drosophila, it's real data, so um, we have no way to exactly measure the error rate. So this is really the, the misalignment rate. Um, and which which is going to include not just errors but also biological uh, variation. Okay. And if you if you look at the whole, like more the distribution um, of the error rates, this is before error correction and after error correction, and we see this blue curve here. Um, so let's see. Um, I do have time. So uh, we wanted to see how many. The, the effect of read depth, the, the effect that read depth has on the um, error correction accuracy. So here uh, we're doing a subsampling experiment. Um, this is the error rate uh, before correction. And of course it doesn't, that doesn't depend on the reads per transcript. And the blue curve is the error rate after um, correction. So one thing that might jump out here is that even with one read, uh, we can error correct it. Um, and that might seem strange, but this is actually an important uh, aspect of our algorithm. We, we cluster the reads initially according to gene family of origin. And that means we're going to put together reads from different transcripts, from different isoforms, but that will share an exon. Um, and so this exon, a particular exon, may have more than one read containing it. And so we can use that to error correct it, even if the whole isoform is covered just by one read. However, there's a caveat here is that this will, um, if the two exons are coming from gene, different gene families, and there is an imbalance in the um, uh, abundance of the two gene families, 
then we may overcorrect to the um, to the mutation that occurs in the more frequent gene. Okay, so that brings us to overcorrection, which is uh, kind of an important aspect because, of course, you can correct all your reads down to one true read, and you will have perfect error rate. So we wanted to measure overcorrection, um, and I'm running out of time, so I'll give a quick summary here that we see half a percent of the reads that we do end up overcorrecting in our simulated data. Um, about half of these are reads with low, relatively low abundance. And our overcorrection is usually you know, small. We're talking about point mutations or short indels. We don't see any exon level overcorrection. Um, okay. So uh, we wanted to also see our ability to retain mutations when there is an imbalance in the <coughs> abundance. So this was a, um, a simulation with a short gene um, where we put a SNP in one allele and no SNP in the other allele. And we varied the, the, to the total read depth and the allele frequency of the minor allele. And then we measured uh, the percent of experiments uh, which retain, you know, have at least one read that still retains that mutation, that, that minor allele after a correction, right? So if you see if the, there's a balance, 50% or 40% of um, alleles, then even at low read depths, we retain the minor allele. But uh, if the allele frequency is 10%, then we would need pretty high read depth to, to retain that. Runtime and memory, so um, it's not super great, but it's sort of, uh, it's, uh, I th I, we felt it was good, good enough um, for the time being, and we're working to improve it. So the, uh, the time takes about um, 43 or 50 hours, CPU hours on the large data sets. Um, the RAM is between 100 and, <clears throat> 100 and 400 gigabytes. Um, so we're working on, 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 on improving these numbers. Okay, so to uh, wrap up, I presented Eisen Correct, um, which is an error correction algorithm for transcriptomic nanopore reads that does not rely on reference. Uh, there's things that I didn't have time to get into that we did evaluate in the manuscript, which is the effect of the initial sequencing rate, uh, the number of isoforms per gene, uh, the robustness to different parameter settings and a comparison against uh, the tool that just recently came out. Um, our software is available on GitHub um, and our paper is online. Um, in terms of future work, like I mentioned, speed memory improvements, uh, doing the final step to reconstruct the isoforms and uh, finally exploring um, direct RNA, how this works on, on direct RNA rather than cDNA data. And I think that's uh, that's all I have. So thank you very much, Paul, for your talk. Very nice talk. And uh, we are perfectly on time. So we can go to the next speaker. And we can go back uh, uh, to Paul with uh, the final session with some questions. Uh, so the next speaker is Iman Hajira Sudia from Cornell, which uh, will talk about uh, novel methods for structural variation detection and assembly using long range DNA sequencing. Thank you for being here, for accepting our invitation. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. This has been a great session so far. So. I look forward to the discussions as well. Uh, so my name is Iman. I lead a small uh, group at Wild Cornell Medicine in computational genomics. So my lab basically focuses on uh, genome sequence technology and biology. So I'm going to discuss a few recent methods that we developed recently for characterizing uh, uh, sequence data. But we also work on uh, deep learning image classification of uh, several different type of uh, 
biomedical image, image data sets, such as digital pathology, or recently embryology data sets. We are also interested in cancer genomics in general and building tumor phylogenies, tumor phylogenies using uh, cancer sequence data. So I don't really need to give an introduction to this audience, but as you guys know, with the standard short read sequencing, you can produce a big amount of sequencing data very fast and very cheap. And there are a number of uh, large scale uh, sequencing efforts going on using short read sequencing. Uh, so most methods that leverage short reads uh, to determine sequence genomes are uh, either reference based methods. So you would uh, use the reference and align short read to the reference and look for signal for variations among different genomes. Or you can use a uh, de novo assembly Basically, without looking at the reference, you would assemble long contigs uh, and uh, align these la large segments and large contigs of the reference to, to identify variations. Uh, but as you know, because uh, with short reads, you only get you know, up to like 150 base pair, 200 base pair reads, and the human genome has a lot of large repetitive segments, it's, uh, it's often very challenging to determine where exactly these shortages came from, especially in repetitive regions. Uh, so almost half of the human genome is uh, uh, in repetitive regions, large repetitive regions. And in cancer genomics, this is actually like a bigger problem because we also have the problem of somatic mutations and cancer heterogeneity. So different cells have like different uh, uh, genetic makeup. So when we talk about variations, there are smaller variants such as single nucleoid variants uh, or small indels, uh, but often we are also interested in large scale structure variations. So such as large duplications, uh, deletions, insertions, or uh, more complex events such as translocations uh, or inversion. Uh, so recent studies of uh, long read sequencing uh, have shown that a lot of structure variations, these large, larger events, uh, are missing in short read studies. So this is like a figure, it's a few years old now, from a, from a study by Evan Eichler's group using a, a high coverage uh, pack bio sequencing of a hap, essentially like a haploid genome. And as you can see on this figure, there are a lot of novel deletions or insertions that we did not see using uh, short reads previously. And, uh, in fact, even if you use long reads, only one single technology of long read, we cannot resolve every single region of the genome. So Tobias actually gave a very uh, nice example in his uh, talk earlier this morning that even you know, with, with high quality long read, we cannot, with, with only single technology, we cannot resolve uh, all regions of the genome. Uh, so often uh, uh, people now, use like multiple different platforms and essentially do like hybrid methods of long read and short reads. Uh, so really like just to give a quick introduction, we have like PacBoy and Oxo Nanopore. These are leading long read platforms. They are improving a lot in the recent years. Uh, so the upside is they actually like produce longer reads, like 10 KB to like megabases. Uh, but the downside is still they require a lot of DNA as input. So it's uh, not very suitable for some of the clinical samples. We don't have enough DNA. Uh, and there are still, you know, like compared to Illumina shorty, they have like higher error rates. Although, for example, in high five, we, ha we have improved a lot. But they say typically they have like higher error rates as we, see, we saw in previous talks. And also like they are still more expensive compared to shorties. An alternative that recently came out was link read sequencing. So there was a company, 10X Genomics. Unfortunately, they are not producing linkage anymore for, for some patent issues. But there are some other alternatives, such as BGI or even Illumina itself or Telsic. They would, they would build synthetic long reads. So we'll describe them in, in, a, in a minute. So the upside here is you would get long fragments uh, with uh, uh, high throughput and very low error rate, essentially Illumina level error rate. But the downside is that we don't have linkage information between these short reads. So how these uh, techniques work, uh, for example, in uh, 10X genomics, there was a microfluid technique that would tag short reads from the same long molecules 
with the same barcode. And essentially, when you would uh, when you map these short clip back to reference genome, as you can see on this uh, slide, like uh, different colors, for example, color red here, uh, reads coming from the same underlying long fragment would cluster together, and that would under uh, uh, essentially we call them read clouds. So although we have like short reads, but the uh, positions of these short reads on the on the reference genome can suggest an underlying long fragment. Uh, so these uh, techniques are actually very powerful for some applications such as haplotype phasing or phasing large scale structure variations. And there are a lot of methods actually recently, such as Long Ranger that was developed by Tenex Genomic itself or Supernova, which is a de novo assembly maze method. But there are also like other uh, improved versions such as uh, Athena or CloudSpade for assembly or some methods that we develop in the lab for some specific challenging classes of structure variations that I will uh, describe today. And these uh, uh, techniques actually have applications in cancer genomics too. So you, there are a number of recent studies that show there are some uh, uh, somatic events that could not be determined with short reads, or, but we can, we can see them in, in link, link read sequence. Uh, so when we talk about link read models, we are really looking at two different coverage. Uh, one is, I, I, sh I show here a CF, this is the coverage of these long fragments, long molecules, but we all have short reads of these long fragments. So we, we have CR, the coverage of these short reads from each of these long fragments. Uh, so approximately, you know, the, the total coverage, the total sequence coverage would be CF times CR. Uh, but because uh, we want to keep the total coveraging uh, comparable to a standard, you know, Illumina uh, sequencing. Often CF is very large in, uh, in 10X genomics, for example. So it's like 100, 200, like 200 X. But CR, which is the short read coverage of each long fragment is very, very shallow. So it can be like 0.1 X, for example. Uh, and this technique actually uh, introduces a, a new set of algorithm challenges. Uh, uh, one thing is that each barcode matches several long fragments. Uh, and also, as I said, like each long fragment is covered only sparsely by short reads. So it's uh, very challenging to use, you know, a standard uh, assembly approach to assemble structure variations. So one, one method that we recently developed last year was to uh, essentially approximately solve this link read deconvolution problem. So if you have the link read data, we want to group read with the single barcode into clusters that matches a single long fragment of the DNA. Uh, so in case we have the reference genome in, such as the human genome, uh, this is pretty straightforward. We align the reads to the map, uh, to the reference genome. You can use like a link read specific aligner and these uh, uh, clusters uh, essentially uh, signals the, the long fragment. But we saw this uh, problem in, in metagenomics where we did not have the reference uh, genome. Uh, but because the genome is, uh, we, did not have, we did not have the reference genome, so we have to do this uh, de novo. So we developed like a tool, Minerva, I'm not going to talk uh, uh, in details here, but this is basically a new graph-based algorithm that approximately, that approximately solve this uh, link read deconvolution. And we essentially use these deconvolution, we treat this deconvolution as instances of the community detection problem. So we use a, a clustering algorithm on a, on a graph. Uh, so this was published last year in Genome Research. Uh, you, can, you can read it on, online if, if you like. Uh, but really the talk today is more about structure variations in humans. Uh, so we have the, two methods recently, Valor2, which is de developed for large scale SVs, uh, such as inversions, duplications, or inverted duplications, deletions, or translocations. Uh, Valor was uh, presented last year in ISMB, but the full version uh, just uh, got published in Genome Biology a couple months ago. And Novel X uh, is a new method. Uh, it's still under review, but we have a preprint online. Uh, basically for detecting an assembly of novel sequence insertions. Uh, 
in linked with data. So how does the uh, Valor2 work? Uh, basically, in a nutshell, uh, Valor2 integrates uh, split molecule, pair N, and molecule depth signatures. So this is, uh, this is like an in integrative method. And it's uh, uh, mainly powerful for detecting inver large inversions of more than 80 kb or segmental duplications, uh, uh, more than 40 kb or large deletions or translocations. So essentially the input is a BAM file. Uh, you can use like a, uh, some uh, link with a specific mapper such as Lariant or uh, Long Ranger or, or Emma, for example. Uh, and the output is like a bad PE file. So the main uh, signature that uh, Valor2 uses is the split molecule signature. So essentially, for example, here uh, you're looking at an in inversion method. So we have an inversion uh, uh, signal. So you have an inverted sequence. But when you look at these long uh, uh, read, uh, long uh, fragments or read class coming from those long fragments, you would see uh, some uh, split molecule signatures, such as uh, I'm showing in this cartoon. So Valor2 first identified these sub-molecules uh, in each barcode. These are essentially uh, sub-regions that belong to the same long fragments. Uh, and we would pair these sub-molecules uh, if they signal the same event. So essentially, we also use, uh, use parent support to re short read parent support to filter, filter some of these uh, candidate splits. Uh, and then we would like to see many of these candidate splits across different barcodes. So we have a, we have a strong signal to call, call the event. And we use that by building a graph representing these split molecule pairs. These pairs come from different barcodes now. And we add edges if two pairs with different barcodes agree on a specific event. And once we build this uh, graph, uh, this agreement graph, we would look for approximate clicks uh, in these graphs. And that would uh, indicate our, our structure variation signal. And we can essentially use this generic approach to identify several different types of structure variations. Uh, so we implemented deletions, inversions, inverted duplications, uh, uh, duplication and also translocation. So you can see the full, full description of, of each uh, uh, SV types uh, in the paper. Uh, so we did a lot of experiments using our methods. So first we developed uh, uh, simulated data. So basically we, we planted large SVs uh, using uh, uh, VARSIM and we used the uh, LRSIM. Uh, this is like a link with a specific uh, simulator to, uh, to generate uh, link with data. So you also use the same experiment, same data, uh, but with, with only short read, data, short read simulators. We also applied our method to several uh, re uh, real data sets. So we looked at uh, a trio, a Yoruban trio from the Human Genome Structure Variation Consortium, which was uh, recently characterized using multiple, multiple different platforms. Uh, but we also looked at the uh, genome in a bottle samples. Uh, we looked at, uh, almost 70 different samples from the HapMap uh, or 1000 Genomes project uh, using LinkRead. And we also looked at six uh, cancer samples uh, uh, we recently sequenced as a pilot project uh, from our, our hospital. So I'm showing you some of these results here. Uh, so as you can see here on this figure for the duplications, uh, so Valor, uh, and this is like, these are simulated data sets. Uh, Valor2 has a consistently high precision and recall, so more than 80% precision and recall. Uh, and for inversions, again, Valor2 uh, gets a very good precision and very good recall. Uh, and the F1 score is consistently more than any, any short read tool or longer tool in this, in this case, SNFL. Uh, and the best result is really when we got, uh, when we combine long range with Valor2 here. So for deletion, again, Valor2 
uh, outperform forms uh, short tooth methods, uh, as you can see uh, on the figure, and, and same as uh, translocations. So we, we, we see that our tool is actually very pretty powerful for in simulated data sets. So in real data sets, uh, we looked at these lar very large deletions in, se in several uh, uh, germline samples, and also like uh, in CHM1, which is essentially a haploid sample. And as you can see, we have almost all our predictions are, are uh, uh, validated uh, with reported uh, events. And for, the, for inversion, we actually find uh, uh, a, lot more, a lot more events that we, we think uh, they might be real. So Valor identifies large events. So there are other, other tools for linked data, for example, linked or on long range itself, but they are really like, uh, uh, they cannot really go beyond 80 KB. Uh, but, uh, but because we, we are leveraging this split molecule signal, we can essentially, the majority of our SV calls are actually more than 80 KB up to 200 KB. So we are also we are also studying, uh, as I said, uh, uh, about seventy whole genomes uh, uh, from the HATMAP project. So we are we are looking at uh, different uh, uh, events in different populations here, and we are also looking at, at some cancer cancer data, which we not only did uh, link link sequencing, but we also did uh, the standard whole genome sequencing and also optophone mapping. So we are currently analyzing this data, but really like we, we have identified uh, several interesting structure variations with diff different types of SVs across, across, across these samples. Uh, for example, this is a, one example of a deletion in one of our patients where we could not see with, with short trees or, or long ranger, uh, but with Valor2, we could, we could identify this uh, disruptive uh, long uh, deletion which was also validated with, with bio-nano op optical mapping. Uh, so the, the last part of my talk is about uh, novel X, which is another method we developed recently for assembly of novel insertions using link reads. So novel insertions are segments on the genome, uh, on the sequence genome that are not present on the reference genome. So these are totally novel sequences, but they can harbor undiscovered genes so, or characterizing these events actually helps us build comp more comprehensive reference genomes. So traditionally, okay, one way to identify these methods is to do de novo assembly of the whole genome, but this is a pretty expensive computationally. So traditionally what people did was to use resequencing. You would map short to the reference genome and identify two types of reads. These that uh, reads, these blue reads that did not map to the reference genome at all, or reads that only one of the ends map to the reference genome. So these reads would be like a subset of, uh, uh, subset of your, your data, and you can uh, essentially combine uh, or as locally assemble these uh, one and anchor reads together with orphan reads to build these uh, novel sequences. But as you can imagine, because we are using short reads, uh, not only the assembly might, might not be accurate, but also uh, the anchors that we get are very short. They are bounded by your insert size. So it's really hard to locate these uh, uh, novel contexts to the reference genome. So we would like to use uh, link reads to essentially build longer anchors so that would be easier for us to locate uh, these uh, novel sequence reference genome. And that's really the main idea in novel X. So basically we use, uh, we use barcode information across multiple different barcodes and uh, use, a, uh, the, use a new local assembly uh, approach to essentially build uh, these long, long anchors. So we did some uh, tests especially on CHM1, the, the haploid genome that we have uh, uh, high quality packed biodata. And as you can see, novel X uh, ad, outperforms uh, uh, Pamir and Poppins. These are uh, popular short reads, uh, met, short read methods for, for uh, uh, novel insertion discovery. So especially when you are 
looking at a larger larger uh, insertions novel x performs uh, very well so we also looked at uh, we, we also compared novel x with uh, uh, de novo assembly methods as i said as de novo assembly methods are uh, computation more expensive uh, so they, they typically run uh, two three times uh, the running time is two three times more more than novel x but as you can see like still novel x performs very well on, on real data sets when you compare with with the pack bio as as ground truth so we also applied novel x to our uh, uh, half map cohort and we identified more than 24,000 uh, insertions across all these uh, whole genomes. So we are currently analyzing these, uh, these uh, events. Uh, but some, one cool figure that I found was uh, actually when, you, when I look at like unique insertion sites across these genomes, you can see like uh, a, a cumulative distribution like this. So it's actually like getting towards like a plateau here. These are genomes from, from different populations. And we also identified uh, uh, several uh, disruptive gene insertions. So we are currently looking more and more closely here, uh, but you can see like some, some of them are actually like very high frequency in, in some of these populations. Uh, so just to conclude, I described the three of our recent methods, Minerva developed by David Danko, uh, Valor, uh, Valor 2, uh, is a joint joint project with uh, John Alka's lab in Bilkent, a novel X developed by my student Dimitri Meleshko. And these all tools are available op open source on GitHub now. So with this, I'd like to acknowledge my lab uh, and my collaborator at Wild Cornell, and also uh, the funding agencies, uh, especially NIGMS and NSF that funded that work. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sam, for your talk. Very nice talk. I think, you, uh, uh, I think uh, we have uh, now time for questions, finally. Yeah, we have some time. Um, shall I go through the ones that are um, live uh, now? Um, uh, yeah, I had a, a question for uh, Valentina. I don't know if she answered or not. I did, I did answer it. Ah, okay, sorry. I, I must have missed that, yeah. Ah, yes, okay, okay. I, I have I announced your question. So my, my question is whether, was whether machine learning can actually give benefits for the specific problems we investigated? Um, and then you say models can be linear and nonlinear. Okay. Can I ask a question to Iman? Yeah, yeah, of course, please go ahead. Uh, okay, Iman, thanks for this uh, nice presentation. I am a bit uh, uh, puzzled about the inversion numbers. So the numbers uh, I recollect from the Chasen 2019 paper were much higher. So with hundreds of inversions, Per genomes and particularly the large ones tend to be embedded in duplication. So, did you ever look at how well you capture inversions that have duplications on the flanks? Uh, we actually can detect inverted duplications, uh, but I don't think we have uh, really did a comprehensive uh, comparison yet. No, I didn't talk about inverted duplications, but in a simple inversion where there's duplicated sequence in the flanking sequence, because this is something you have very often that there's one piece of sequence on one end and another piece that's the same on the other end, the sequence in between them inverts. And this makes it often so difficult to call them. So I was wondering whether you looked specifically or stratified your results based on uh, segmental duplication in the flanking sites. Yeah, I don't think we can we can actually detect it with with, with this method. Yeah. Iman, there is uh, some other question uh, for you. 
on the panel. It says, Dear Iman, is it better to have a high coverage for short reads in segments and low coverage for segments themselves? Uh, it depends on the application, but the short answer is no, especially if you want to phase the larger scale structure variation. Okay. Um, and, sorry, and one alternative way is to do high coverage on both, but that would be very expensive. So there are there are like traditional techniques that do high coverage on both, but that they are super expensive and, and no one really uses them now. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul, I see also one for you. Um, it says, I didn't understand, it comes from Hiren Karathia. Uh, I didn't understand your point of reference free error correction. Is the error, if the error is corrected through learning from variability in raw signals of the nanopore data, or you first assemble the gene from the nanopore data and confirm the SNP status by ma mapping back to reference genome? Uh, I think uh, neither of the two. We, we error correct reads by comparing them to each other. But I guess the point and the other point to add there is that we are, we've already, we're assuming the reads have already been base called. We're not, we're not revisiting that. And then Paul asks you, uh, what are the steps that require a lot of memory in his own correct? You said that you use clustering and process clusters in parallel. So I can imagine that the huge memory is in combining minimizers on long reads. Uh, I yeah, good question. I'm afraid to give the wrong answer. That's the kind of details that Christopher would know more uh, about, but I can, I can I can answer that offline, maybe yeah. get, get the correct answer. Okay, I see also that several questions uh, have already been answered also by Tobias here. Um, I don't know if someone in the panel has uh, a question for uh, another uh, panel member or Yuri, do we have any? Have we missed something? Uh, well, I, I was, <laughs> I never saw that some question were answered offline. So maybe we have some more time for uh, answering live of a question that were already answered uh, by writing them. So that uh, people yeah, yeah, in uh, the conference can, uh, or do they can? Ah, oh, I see. There's a panel with the answered question. Yes. Yeah. Actually, I got another one for Iman, if I may. Yeah, yeah, no, no, please go ahead. Uh, so, so what's your, what's your perspective on link tree technology? Where will it, where will it go? Or, I mean, with prices for long reads dropping, do you, do you foresee that long reads will take over or will there be a space for link treats going forward? I think there will be still space, especially, for example, with some of the applications that we do in metagenomics or cancer genomics, uh, because we don't have enough material to do uh, long reads. So usually, you know, like, you need like 100 times more DNA if you want to do like long read sequencing. So this is one, uh, I guess, one space for like Illumina short read or link read method that they can still uh, uh, be leveraged. Uh, yeah, error rate. Uh, so I think like hack bio high bio has a very good error rate, you know, like, uh, as you know, like, uh, you can build very nice assemblies with hi fi. But hi fi is, is very expensive still compared to Illumina. Uh, but like ONT is like cheaper, but again has higher error rate. So you, you still need, you know, to do some error corrections or, you know, like, uh, use like some consensus approaches, which may not be Again, ideal if you want to do, you know, like uh, uh, resolve, you know, like uh, cancer genomes or yeah, like uh, heterogeneity, things like that. So I think it would be uh, still interesting to look at short reads, uh, linked read methods. Uh, yeah. Thanks.
Oh, I have uh, maybe a, a general question uh, to, to everyone to, to who, who want to, to answer to the question. Um, what are the challenges that uh, shifting to, to pan genomes? Uh, uh, well, the challenges in the research you presented, uh, and uh, is it an opportunity? Is it uh, a burden? Can uh, actually improve accuracy of the results uh, or only a lot of efforts uh, without accuracy, gaining accuracy? I think the biggest challenge is really demonstrating uh, the value for downstream applications. So really show that people in, I don't know, medical genetics have, an, have a benefit from, from switching to, to such genome representations. Is it a problem of methods, uh, of data, of love? I think Which both. came first? Uh, yeah. Do you need to improve data um, or methods first? Yeah, that's probably happening at the, I mean, people tend to notice that they need new methods when they have the new data and find that the old methods don't work anymore. So uh, I don't know whether this is a good answer. Thanks. So do we have any uh, other question here? Let me check. Um, I, th I think that um, uh, there is a question by Paola for uh, Iman. Uh, let me check. Iman, what is the cost of linked reads technology versus nanopore? I'm not sure if you. Uh, so it's, I think it's comparable. So uh, nanopore, you know, they have like different uh, platforms. So some of them, for example, Chromatrian is, is cheaper compared to like Minion or, or others. Uh, and it's uh, cheaper if you buy, you know, like, uh, you know, like a lot of flow cells at the same time. So really they have like a kind of weird price model. So if you want, want to buy only like a, you know, like one flow cell uh, versus, you know, like a hundred flow cell, you know, like they, they, they pricing models like very different. So it's like two, three times uh, uh, more. Uh, uh, so, so if you have like a large scale project with, with Nanopore, it would be like much cheaper compared to like, if you have like a small, a smaller project in your lab. Uh, link read, you know, like it's essentially the same as Illumina short read uh, sequencing, the, co the cost of it. Uh, uh, but you, you still have like an upfront cost for the like, library prep. So it, which, uh, which depends on what kind of link platform you are using. Uh, so with 10X, uh, it's, I would say it's, it's about roughly it's like 50% more uh, mm -hmm. than your typical uh, Illumina sequencing because of the upfront library prep cost. But with some of these newer link read models, because they are not using uh, uh, the 10X Chromium like uh, uh, machine, they are like single tube uh, link read, that can be in theory much cheaper. So essentially like just a few hours of your, your lab technician time plus the, uh, well, they, you still have, need to get the kit. So it's again, roughly like maybe 50% more than uh, mm. Illumina, Illumina short. Okay. Um, Tobias, um, Milan says, uh, maybe I missed it, but how did you actually create the pan genome you used regarding the pan geny work? Oh, that's an excellent question. I indeed didn't really show this. Um, I mean, we, in, in that case, we did something very simple. We just used a, a mini map to align the context of the assemblies to the GLCH38 uh, GLCH reference genome and called variant path tools. And then 
create from each from each variant um, well basically create a bubble and overlapping variants would, would uh, result in bubbles that are uh, multi allelic so I think this is a well most simple way you can create such a graph which you can express as a, as a VCF file so it's very uh, very simple um, I think going forward we want to also try this on more well, using more sophisticated ways to construct such a reference graph. But well, actually, we were surprised that using the simple method already uh, helped. So it, it's, um, oh, but there's room for improvement. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, uh, Tobias. Uh, also, uh, Sevda asks whether the slides will be shared. But uh, yeah, as so always said that, um, the main organizers are recording um, the workshop and these will be uh, posted after the, the event. But uh, if uh, one of the participants want, uh, wants a specific set of slides, I think it's uh, best if they ask the, um, the speakers uh, via email perhaps. Um, yeah, um, for the moment, I think we answered all questions. Yes, thank you. Mm. Yuri, is there um, anything else? Ah, no. Okay, so there is uh, one more question I see now. Um, and this um, regards all of you. So, do the brewing graphs will the brewing graphs survive with nano work or long read technologies? This is a what very is provocative it? question. <laughs> what, is, what is your opinion? I mean, this is open for anyone uh, to, to to answer. Is to all speakers. But I want to hear Paul's perspective. <laughs> I think Paul is the best. <laughs> No, I, I think they'll definitely survive. We, because it's not just for uh, short read data. You're looking at, for example, pan genome, pan -genome stuff. A lot of it is based on um, um, reference genomes and building the burn graphs from already assembled reference genomes. And then also long reads are, they're not going to eliminate short reads. So we still, like metagenomics, we still see a lot of short read uh, data. And also as a kind of index, I mean, I think, I, I think the Bruin graphs are more broadly Paul, interesting than there, just there, for short read data. A, there is a small joke made by Alex. Uh, so he said, be aware because Pavel may be listening. So watch your answer. <laughs> but, but I'm curious what, I'm probably biased here, but I'm curious what other people uh, think. Yeah, actually, I, maybe I can answer with an anecdote about this assembly thing that I, I, I mentioned. So this was a very high quality uh, graph built in a well, complicated fashion, but essentially, you know, you can picture it as an overlap graph. But then it turned out it didn't have all the uh, variation we were actually looking for. And what Miko, that's when he invented this uh, MBG tool uh, to build something into brown graph with a huge K. So if you use hi-fi reads, for instance, and do homopolymer compression, you can build the brown graphs with a K of, I don't know, 2000. And they are very useful. So maybe the concept will survive also with error corrected long reads potentially. So I, I personally don't think there's such, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I personally think there's not a such, such a big difference anyway. Uh, I mean, the concept, it's kind of fluent. If you build one graph or the other, if you build, I don't know, the brown graph and sample uh, based on minimizers, so as far as the brown graph or something like this, which almost looks like an overlap graph at the end of the day. I don't know. So I think the, 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 this sharp distinction probably doesn't really help the community too much. Anybody else? 
Maybe I would add that, just to follow up on that. That yeah, yeah really. What, to be with after you were saying that, the burn saying the burn graph is really talking about looking at k-mers like that's your unit of analysis. Uh, so yeah, that, that can you can do that in a lot of places. It's not just with short reads. Yeah, that's just a matter of your presentation. I agree. Um, do we have anything else? No other question for now. So what do you think, Yuri, should we wrap up? Uh, yes, Unless if the, the speaker is a little bit earlier, so. It must be really late in Tokyo or Kunihiko, so <laughs> perhaps we should, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, thank you everyone, um, the speakers, but also the participants who still, most of them are here with us. I see more than 50 at the moment. Uh, thank you for your talks. And um, yeah, we'll keep everyone uh, posted about uh, the next uh, Bangaya event in particular. Yuri, am I forgetting uh, anything? No. Thanks, uh, everybody, for, for their time and for attending the, the workshop. And hope to see you soon. Uh, yeah, basically. and maybe not virtually. <laughs> and big thanks to the two of you for organizing this. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. It was great. It's great seeing seeing friends too. Yeah. Ciao. Bye bye. bye.